you to apply the strict application of the code. We're going back at this time. We're going back at this time. We would have granted it. Yeah. Uh, she had to adjust the tape to make sure we had tape in the machine. Okay, that's why we took it. Right. Okay, please read the staff summary for case 20-2022. All right, thank you all. That didn't take near as long as we thought it would. Um, this is case number 20-2022, BZA. The location is at 830 Ackley Road. Uh, the applicant is James and Pamela Wiest, the property owners. Um, the zoning is B, single family residence. The request is to allow a 12 by 16 accessory structure to be located in what is designated as their front yard for zoning definition where accessory structures are only permitted in the rear yard. So this is a corner lot. The applicants are using the side of their house uh, along Asbury Hills uh, for patio and seating area. So the applicants are proposing a gazebo structure in this area, which would be 12 feet by 16 feet, approximately 190 square feet. Uh, because it's located on this area, because it's a corner lot, both street frontages are considered front yards for zoning purposes, and an accessory structure is only allowed in the rear yard. The house was constructed in 1968, and the current owners um, purchased it in November of 2014. So just a little bit of history, in November of 2021, um, the owner did submit plans for a deck project, um, but they did not move forward with that. So this is the map or cages drawing of the site in question. Again, it is in the corner lot and it faces Ackley Road and their driveway is, from, is, is off of Ackley Road. So the area, can you see, yeah, with my mouse, mm -hmm. this area here is considered their rear yard area for zoning purposes because of the corner lot. This area is a front as well as this area. And the, the location of the property in question is, is where my mouse is, off of Asbury Hills. This is the topography map. This is the site plan that was submitted again, a uh, gazebo on the side of their home, on the Asbury Hills side of their house. These are the site photos. This is looking back at the corner, looking toward Asbury Hills. This is looking at down their driveway at their two accessory structures, which are permitted in this location. This is their designated rear yard area. This is behind their house, which is actually considered a side yard area for zoning purposes. This is the front looking uh, from Ackley. And this is the area where the proposed gazebo would be located, their, their area where the patio is and their seating area. This is the front looking down Ackley. Again, just look different shots looking at uh, vantage points of their patio. And this is looking across the street, Asbury Hills. Looking from the street toward the patio area. So um, staff findings, because it is a corner lot, these are always tricky of what yard is, you know, used as a rear versus what is used as a front and a side. But because of its high visibility on the corner lot, staff does have concerns and is not supportive of the accessory structure in this general location. Um, it would be quite visible from both streets, Asbury Hills and Ackley. The essential character of the neighborhood could be altered because of the location, um, you know, for any accessory structure in this particular area. Um, as far as could their predicament be feasibly obviated, not necessarily for an accessory structure over here, but there are other uh, options um, for shelter. So I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions? Mm -hmm. nope. oh, okay, all right. Will the appellant or the appellant's representative please come to the podium, speak into the microphone, state your name, address, any affiliation, or present your appeal. James Wiest, property owner at 830 Ackley. Uh, the application was, or appeal was sent with my wife's name on it too. Does she need to stand? Pardon? Okay. Does my wife need to stand with me since she's- No, no. she can count and support you later. Okay, okay. all right. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. Okay. Um, so back to the history part of this, actually that's a great view. When uh, I was working with Brad Bowers to see if I could do a deck off of the side of the house which would be east uh, the 10 foot um, just shy of 11 foot to the property line I would have I would have had to 
build that deck three foot shorter, which would allow a seven foot deck off the back of the house, which is not very much room at all. Um, <clears throat> where that deck was going to be is on the north side of the house where our, our kitchen is kind of located in a dining room. And honestly, at the time and still these times, lumber is just way too volatile to try to build a deck by yourself. And it would be a lot of undertaking structurally to attach it to the house. Um, <clears throat> So we, d we decided to start thinking about this gazebo um, and the gazebo or pergola or however you want to say it, it's very low profile. Um, it's going to be uh, the lower part where it sheds, it would shed south. Um, the lower part is just over seven feet and the upper part is nine feet. Um, so it wouldn't uh, impede on the upper floors windows of the house. And if you go back to any number of those pictures that show the house being gray, we painted it last year. Um, the structure roof is translucent, but it's a smoke uh, color that actually matches that gray perfectly. So it virtually disappears. Um, and we just, the way that it's oriented, and you can see it on the site plan and everything, that uh, there's just not a whole lot of, we don't really have a backyard, um, and we'd like to create an outdoor space with some shelter other than umbrellas any further any further information uh no okay any questions from the board do you know how big that patio is it's 20 by 30. 20 by 30. where on the patio do you propose to to put it so uh, the patio, i know there's a drawing attached here yep. that shows you're approximately what is it uh, four feet from that left side 12 of that feet picture. from the from the is that from the when you say the seven feet is that seven feet from the house correct okay so which is then that patio looks to be approximately five or six around five feet or so from the house the patio is uh, exactly three feet from the house three feet wow it's closer than I think. it looks yeah, yeah. There. it created a nice little flower bed there okay are there any pictures of the proposed structure the design um, or I have sketches from the subcontractor. Um, if you could share that. Bright covers. Uh, I have. I brought three copies. Yeah, if you could. Yeah, if you could with submit those. Down there. Okay. So, so is not the concrete patio an accessory structure? No, a concrete patio is not an accessory structure. It can pretty much go anywhere on your property. Okay. Just like a driveway, basketball court, you know, anything of that nature. On this drawing here, where is your, your, is your house here? Is this where your house is? It would be, you a can, plan you, nor, it would be plan and direction. At the top? North. Is it Correct. plan top? Yes, sir. That's where your house is? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. And then it will slope towards? The south. Which is Asbury towards Hills. what would you would cons typically consider the back of your property? Or is that uh, no? It slope forward. Slope so forward to mm -hmm. the street side. Correct. Oh. Okay. Yeah, the highest point would be towards the house, okay. lowest that, away. Okay. That'd be against the house. The yeah, house, the street the slope is the street. Yeah. Okay. Did you get, you actually got a, uh, all right, all right, I'm, we're short a sheet. Looks like he's looking at uh, structural. Uh, 
No, I got, I'm, I was looking at what. What do you, you need? Oh, uh, yeah, never mind. I, what were you looking at in the back there? I had a different. Oh, never mind. I see what you were doing, looking at. Okay. <coughs> All right. Are there any further questions from the board? Scott? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there anyone who'd like to speak in support of the appeal? Please come to the podium. Be recognized, speak into the microphone, state your name, address, and any affiliation to the case. Yes, hi, I'm Amy Stoll. I live at 7976 Asbury Hills Drive. And um, I am a neighbor and a friend of the Wiest. Um, they, I've seen pictures of this proposed structure um, and I have seen the work that they have done over the last few years to improve the, the property and improve the value of the property. Um, I greatly believe that this will not only raise their property values, but collectively, hopefully, raise ours a little bit because they are doing so much to uh, better their home. So uh, I'm very much in support of this structure and um, hope you would consider that. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Okay. Anyone else like to speak in support of the appeal? Come to the podium, state your name, address, and any affiliation. Hi, I'm Lori Schuldmeyer. I live at 8025 Ayersbury Hills Drive. And um, so we are uh, close neighbors to the Weiss. Um, we are practically right across the street from them, a little bit catty corner. Um, I have admired everything that they have done with their property uh, since they have moved in. They have done nothing but beautify it and improve it, and everything has been tastefully done. Um, I have no problem at all with their plans. I think it, it sounds like a great plan, um, everything that they have said about it, and um, would hope that you guys would approve it. And uh, I have every confidence that it's going to improve their property and the neighborhood. It's not going to be an eyesore or anything by any means. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Okay. Thank you. Anyone else who'd like to speak in support? Please state your name, address, any affiliation. Hi, I'm Erica Roddinghouse, and my address is 8026 Asbury Hills Drive. I am the immediate east neighbor to the Weiss house. So you are seeing my house in the in the background, that garage part. Okay. Um, everything that they've done in the yard, like uh, the other two ladies have said, has made their yard more usable, which I believe is nice, and they've done it in such a tasteful way. The where they're planning to put the structure is close enough to their house that there is enough space from that structure to the road that it's not impeding being able to see towards the west side. Um, it would not impede my visualization whatsoever from the driveway, um, as well as while it does look like there's sh shade right now, um, as soon as those, the sun comes over those trees, it's blazing hot and they don't have a lot of space. I mean, they literally were in their driveway, had a little tiny iron table in their driveway trying to find something in the shade. Um, so I am totally in support of it. I, um, they usually do ask my opinion before they do anything for, for the yard. Um, and so I am completely in support of this. Thank you. Right. Any questions from the board? No. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak in support? Come to the microphone, state your name, address, any affiliation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Schildmeyer. I also live at 8025 Asbury Hills, pretty much cat a corner uh, from their house. <clears throat> so we have a very good view of that side yard. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I think something that you can see on, on the, the photo that's been provided is that he has um, greenery uh, that abuts up to their fence. So I believe that the fence and what's planted there has not reached its full potential height wise. So that will obscure anything that he puts on there anyway. So really it's kind of a moot point. Um, everything they've done to that property has been an improvement, like the ladies have said. They're excellent neighbors. 
um, and they're very conscientious about what they do on the property. And I think this is a rule that in its essence is a very good rule, but given their situation with the house and absolutely no room in the back, that this would not be a problem. And I don't think there'd be any complaints. Mm -hmm. So I just ask for them that you uh, approve this. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, any questions from the board? Okay. Anyone else who'd like to speak in support of the appeal? Okay. Hearing none, is there anyone who, who would like to speak in objection to the appeal? Please come to the podium. State your name, address, and any affiliation. Uh, here, bring them over here. And distribute, they'll distribute them. Yeah. Good evening. My name is Carol Nestler, and I'm a resident of the subdivision Brittany Acres. I live at 857 Strathcoma Drive. I am here to request that you deny the variance, and I'll give you my reasons. I met one of their neighbors today who lives directly across the street from them, and he assured me that the homeowners are lovely people. I don't doubt that for a minute. And I'm a lovely person too. But I'm here to say why I think the variance should be denied. In their letter requesting the variance, they stated that um, their front yard property is not usable space and they wanted a space for outdoor enjoyment and entertaining. And I included with my visual aid a picture, but I see I didn't have to waste my ink since you already have a picture. Um, if they, they said their property, their front yard was not usable, but as we can all see from the picture, they provided themselves with an extra large concrete slab and outdoor furniture. They have an outdoor space to enjoy and entertain friends and family. And according to the zoning resolutions, a gazebo is considered a backyard accessory. And since you are on this board, I'm sure you understand there is a reason to refer to a gazebo as a backyard accessory. It doesn't belong in the front yard. It, I, I think by placing a gazebo there would add to the campground appearance that now exists in the front yard. And the homeowners are asking for nearly a 50% increase in what the zoning board has determined as the required space for a setback. So if their setback is 40 feet, where they want to place the gazebo is seven feet from the house, the structure, and the gazebo would take up an additional 12 feet towards the Asbury Hillside. So instead of a 40 foot setback, it would technically be a 21 foot setback. That's not a small request. And I understand that their neighbors have come forward to support that the variance be granted because they're lovely people and they all get along, which I think is great. In this day and age, everybody gets along. But I think a, placing a gazebo in the front yard, which is on the main thoroughfare of the road that goes through the neighborhood, will detract from the aesthetics of the neighborhood and affect property values. 
So it affects more than just the people directly next to them or behind them. It affects every homeowner in the neighborhood. Zoning laws, as you know, I don't need to tell you this, they are adopted for a reason. And good zoning laws that are enforced makes a neighborhood, makes the Anderson Township community attractive to future homeowners. If you were interested in buying a piece of property, wouldn't you drive through the neighborhood to see how well maintained the neighborhood is before you spend a lot of money? And it appears, I don't know when the concrete slab was poured, their letter, I think, is dated July 12th, but that slab was poured very close, if not on that date. So it appears that they've already found a solution to what they see as a predicament. They have provided for themselves an outdoor, outdoor entertaining space. Um, they stated in their letter that placing a gazebo in their front yard, they feel, would increase the value of their property. And as that is a subjective opinion, I also hold the subjective opinion that I feel it would decrease the value of everyone's property. And it would take away from the quiet, quaint neighborhood that Brittany Acres is. If I have not convinced you at this point to deny the variance, I have one more very important point to make. In April of 2015, the property owners at the corner of Strathcoma Drive and Asbury Hills Drive, another corner lot with no usable backyard, requested a zoning variance to build a screened-in porch on the front of their home. They asked for a three-foot variance to the setback in the zoning resolutions. Their request was denied. The variance request before you this evening is asking for a 19-foot variance, along with permission to put a backyard structure in their front yard. If you grant this request, after the board denied a similar smaller request, I would hate to see anyone bring a discrimination suit, a lawsuit against the township. I am not an attorney, nor am I related to an attorney. I bring this to your attention as a precautionary measure. What is considered fair for one homeowner should be considered fair for all homeowners. And with all due respect, I'm asking that you deny this request for a variance. I would like to thank the board for your consideration of this matter, and also for the volunteers on this board for your service to our community. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from the board? None? Steve? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else would like to speak in opposition to the appeal? Anyone present want to speak in opposition to the appeal? Okay. Uh, Mr. Wiest, would you like to rebut or say anything to what was said? May I yes. You were sworn, right? You, you did yes. swear. Okay. Mm -hmm. State um, your name, address. Pam Louise, 830 Ackley Road. Um, first rebuttal, she talked for over eight minutes. Timer went off, you didn't stop her. Everyone else talked for three, just pointing that out. Um, I'd like to know the variance that she cited, if she had any property rights or interests in that property where it was denied. Um, I'm not sure that we're applying for a variance for um, she was talking about feet 
from the road and the home we just asked for a shade structure she used the word gazebo often when i hear the word gazebo i see a big pointy roof sides looks like an octagon to me that's a gazebo that's not what we're asking for um i do regret that i did not print off pictures of the actual structure that we wanted to purchase um there is a website if you guys want to go and look at it while you're thinking and mulling this over it's called bright covers um they have the picture of the exact structure on their website um it's it has four posts a slanted roof that disappears it's the same color of our home um, it has a small gutter system on it. Um, it's not going to detract from the value of homes. Um, I think the variance hearings that you guys have and the consideration that you have for each individual case is there for a reason. So if you deny somebody else, doesn't mean you're going to deny, deny everybody. Um, as previous when you were talking about the fences, just because you approve one person the second person, they got to apply as well. So just because you didn't approve something on somebody else's property, you had reasons for that. It, that doesn't mean there's a blanket disapproval for everyone else. So um, I really hope you approve it. And I wish I had a picture for you, and I apologize. Okay. Thank you. Any questions from the board? This structure is going to be open on all sides, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Just the roof is basically Yeah, open. it's just it's just for shade. It's it's four posts and an, uh, and an angled roof. Correct. Basically. Okay. All right. right. Okay. Is the roof transparent or is it opaque or is it? Um, it's like a smoky gray when the person came out to show us. Mm -hmm. We held it up to the house and it's like it disappeared. Okay. Um, it's supposed to block all UV light. And, all right. So. Thank you. Yep. Anyone who hasn't spoke wants to speak in support? Is there any other words in opposition? Any other words in opposition to the appeal? Third time, any other words in opposition to the appeal? Hearing none. Mr. Chair, um, there appears to have been constructed another accessory structure within the front yard that is not reflected on staff's report that was given to this uh, by by the woman just um, in opposition in, 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 yeah in opposition and I was questioning as to whether or not um, uh, a zoning certificate has been provided for that what are you referring to? Are you referring to the trial of structure? Yeah. I guess that's it. Uh, <clears throat> that looks more like a trellis to me. Yeah. It's an accessory structure. Yes, technically it is an accessory structure. No, we did not issue a zoning certificate for it. You have not issued a zoning certificate for it? Right, no. Okay. So we would, we would say that that structure is in violation. Yes. Okay. Any further discussion from the uh, board for Fargo? Hold, hold on. Okay. Um, I would I would ask the appellant. Uh, did you get a zoning certificate for uh, the structure that was erected at the corner of your house? This one that you're looking at. No, sir. It's a open trellis. I didn't know it was an accessory structure. It's just supporting the steering. Okay. <clears throat> well, um, I'll gladly pay for one if I need to get one now. Because the wisteria is gorgeous. Well, I'm not. I'm not comfortable to, tonight. I'm not comfortable moving forward without coming to some terms with what's already there. That has been erected in violation. Okay. So that's that's where I am at, at the moment. Uh, Paul, is that two separate issues? 
it is two separate issues, so I think there's a couple of ways to handle it. You can continue and hear both of them next month as accessory structures in the front yard area if the applicant wishes to keep it there and mm -hmm. and, and follow that route. Um, you could decide on the um, the other structure tonight, but then a separate application would need to be made on the other, which is a separate fee, separate, you know, the whole thing. So it may make, be advantageous to hear them both at the same time. Okay. We would just keep the case open and continue it until next month. Do unless, I? Um, or you could, you know, remove it. We can't issue a zoning certificate as of right. It's the same thing as the accessory structure mm -hmm. in the front yard area. So you, so what, you can? What, what was it? Oh, cannot. Cannot. It cannot. It, right. Yeah. Okay. So, so it you, would be a separate sorry, variance. Repeat to keep. that, please. Okay. So it is an accessory structure it is in the front yard area same request that you're asking for over your patio so a couple of options you could request the board go ahead and make a decision on your we're calling it a gazebo because that's how it was in the site plan but your your structure over top of your patio you could have them request that they go ahead and make a decision on that tonight mm -hmm. you could re request a continuance and we would reconsider next month, but also consider this trellis. The decision's not gonna be tied together. They're, you know, they're, they're two separate structures, but you could keep it as one case. Um, or you could, you know, request that they go and make a decision on the um, gazebo and then either remove the trellis or file a separate application for that but then that's a whole new application fee process and separate variance mm -hmm. and hearing okay to keep the trellis right i think she'll kill me if i kill the wisteria um, <laughs> well i would suggest that we continue the case well it's still his option I suggest we continue the case. <laughs> it's still his option. So you have the option, as he well, hold explained. Hold on, hold on. For a, for a number of reasons. Okay. Um, um, I mean, all of a sudden we've started to get a lot of construction that's going into the front yard. Um, and construction that is dis disparate in its character. Okay, so you put a wood... wood Thing up uh, and now you're gonna go do some bronze something and so when I start to think about our um, uh, conditions in which we look at you know all of a sudden I, I'm beginning to think that the character is gonna start getting getting altered because there's no overall plan or homogeneity to what you're trying to do I would disagree, but well, that's okay. That, Before that's, you make your decision, okay, but but, but yeah. that's where I'm saying is that I would is that I would suggest you go back and take a look at what you're trying to do holistically, mm -hmm. so we can yeah. take a look and 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 discuss the the you know how it's going to affect the neighborhood. Okay. If he decides, when does he have to file to get in to the next months? The board can also decide to continue the case as well. It's, it's both of your decisions. You can decide to continue, and the applicant can also request a continuance. So it's it's kind of both. So if I decide to continue, just to clarify, this would be added on to the same variance. Yes, we can remod. You know, yes, we okay. can re-advertise and. Would he have time to do that mm -hmm. in time to make yes. next month? Mm -hmm. I don't want you to put this off for two or three, you know, we're, right. you know, we want to. The 12th would be the deadline for the when next, is the, the 12th. 12th. The mm -hmm. 12th would be the deadline of this month to submit on the next trellis. Next Friday. Next Friday. Yeah. And so it's just so you know all the facts of what you're dealing with. If you don't make the 12th, then mm -hmm. it pushes it to another month. And then the okay. meeting itself is going to be on September the 1st. Okay. And that's a Monday. No. Thursday. Thursday. That's Thursday, sorry. They're all on Thursdays. Okay. Uh, what, what, let him finish and then come up yeah. here to ask. Okay. Um, okay. If you two need to consult, we'll, we'll we hold. 
and you two, if you would like to consult on this before you respond, yeah. I, I don't have an issue with that. You can table yeah. the case pending our next case. Well, you need to take I 10 minutes? Minute. I need two minutes. Okay, you need two minutes, we'll give you two minutes. And if the board isn't comfortable making a decision tonight, the board can also continue right. the case. I, I want yeah, him to have one. every option in his I appreciate corner, that. Not, we don't want to be pushing him in one way or the other. Recesses for two minutes. Two minute recess. Oh, here we go. Thirty seconds. Okay. <laughs> so you've just so I get it on the record, you've you've agreed to continue to the next month, correct? Yes. So yes, you are going to continue to the next month. Yes, sir. Thank you. We appreciate everything you've done this evening, and and all who have been here regarding this case. We appreciate your input on both sides of the issue. The case will be continued till next month. Okay. Thank you, sir. As part Thank of the continuation, I'd ask the staff to pull the uh, information in that case referred to by the opposition, the April 2015 case. Yes, we can provide that. We'll provide that. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Good job. All right. Does anyone on the board need a minute or two break or not? Are we ready nope. to keep going? Keep okay. Going. All right. Will you please read the staff summary for case 21 2022? So the applicant is Norma, Norman, and Lisa Garcia, who are the property owners. The location is at 778 Strathcoma Drive. The zoning there is B residence. And the request is a conditional use and variance request to allow short-term rental with parking located in the front yard area where it's required to be located in the rear. Short-term rentals are a conditional use in single-family zoning districts, and they're required to meet certain, um, certain conditions. The definition of a short-term rental is the rental of a primary residence or portion thereof for a period of less than 30 nights for which the guest compensates a hosting platform owner or lessee of the unit. A little bit of history here. The house was constructed in 1963 and the owners purchased the property in October of 2021. Um, there are no zoning certificates on file. In June of 2022, staff received a complaint uh, regarding a short-term rental facility being operated on the property. We did confirm that that was the case. We sent a letter to the owner who uh, contacted us right away asking how they could bring the property into compliance. So this is a property map. It's there at the cul-de-sac of Strathcoma. This is the aerial of the, of, this, of the home. The topography map. And this was just a drawing provided um, by the applicant, just outlining their driveway and what parking is, off-street parking is available um, for the short-term rental. These are some of the site photos. The front of the house is a, um, the driveway, as you can see, is a single car driveway, um, but it is a long driveway with a side entry garage. It's just looking at the surrounding um, homes and neighboring homes. This is the side entry garage in the area of the driveway they're proposing for guests to park, as well as the side yard area in, fr in front, basically the entire driveway. This is the backyard of the site in question, showing an outside seating area as well. Just other outside shots of the home and surrounding properties. So uh, with a conditional use, um, these are a little bit different than the variance requests, although this does encompass a, a variance request. Short-term rentals are required to meet certain conditions, as well as the different standards that we look at, our spirit and intent, no adverse effect, protection of public services. So let's start with the spirit and intent. Um, staff was of the opinion that it did meet all the conditional use standards with the exception of the parking. No adverse effect. Um, the applicant submitted information how they felt that they met the standard. Um, the applicant stated that there are two ring doorbells on the property, remote pin code, doorknob entry system that is reset for each guest. And there are also rules that apply for all guests that address noise, odor, vibration, and dust. Um, and those are provided in the booking instructions. Protection of public services. The applicant stated that um, the short-term rental respect, I'm sorry, I skipped one in the, 
no, we didn't. Protection of public services that the applicant has not changed the exterior of the single family residence. Um, it doesn't impact uh, scenic and historic features or, or of significant public interest. Um, it is consistent with the adoption of the adoption township plan, which was recently adopted this year, the comprehensive plan. The following sections of the comprehensive plan are in the staff report. With the specific criteria, so F refers to parking. The applicant is requesting a variance from this because it does, um, they do wish to allow parking in the, you know, in their driveway, which is also in their front yard area. Um, the re vehicular use area should be located and designated to minimize impact on the neighborhood. Um, the applicant and staff felt like this was compliant. Measures shall be taken to minimize impact of potential nuisance, and we've discussed that with their um, the features that they have installed on the property. No exterior alterations, and that's compliant. The, the home is um, still as they purchased it. And is, uh, you know blends in with the neighborhood s refers to all exterior lighting and compliance the applicant indicated standard residential lighting will be used v will provide a plan and the applicant um, stated that they have provided an address an email address and phone number to all the neighbors if a concern arises number x refers to meals and no meals will be served by the property owner guests will be responsible for their own meals and z is an emergency response plan um, and the applicant has equipped the home with fire extinguishers, smoke detectors, carbon monoxide, and then emergency contact numbers will be provided. In addition to all of our short-term rentals, we have consulted with the fire and rescue department who stated that there are no additional uh, regulations that are required for short-term rentals versus a single family home. So as far as the variance for parking, the staff did not feel like um, this was substantial. There is parking on the driveway, the side entry garage. The driveway is a, a long driveway. There is also on-street parking as well. So I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Any questions from the board? No. None? Okay. Thank you. Will the appellate or the appellate's representative please come to the podium, speak into the microphone, state your name, address, and your affiliation. Hi, I'm Lisa Garcia. I um, live at 778 Strathcoma Drive in Cincinnati. What else did you want me to say? What other information did you need? You're, you've given oh. your name, your address, and your affiliation. That's okay. Um, I explained, you know, I send everything to the board, but for the purpose, you know, so that our neighbors can hear, you know, how much effort we are putting forth to make sure that um, everything runs smoothly in the house and that neighbors are not bothered at all. I'm just going to um, read what I had sent. Um, my husband and I moved to Cincinnati in August 2021 with our four sons and one daughter because our 15-year-old son, who was born with complicated congenital, congenital heart defects, um, needed a heart and lung transplant. He was accepted into the transplant program at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Um, after living in an RV for three months, we finally were able to find this ranch to purchase, but devastatingly for our family, our boy didn't make it, and we thought we were gonna live in Cincinnati for about two years, but since we, we didn't need to be here anymore, we decided to moved back to Georgia for work purposes. Um, our home in Cincinnati, though, we, we all really loved this home. Everybody who goes to this home, they just love it. It's just very peaceful. We like the area, and it was sentimental to us as um, our son really loved being here. He, it was a great relief after living in an RV, and he really liked the house, and we got to have snow, and um, we got uh, ski. Uh, memberships, you know, ski season passes for skiing, and so we thought, you know, it'd be nice to be able to come back here, but we cannot afford two mortgages, so we decided to try to rent it um, through Airbnb, and we did not realize that we needed a permit through Anderson Township. We ignorantly assumed that we didn't need one because we hadn't needed one 
when we did the same thing for our Georgia house when we rented it short term and we just weren't thinking and didn't know and we sincerely apologize for um, moving forward without you know following the correct procedures um, measures taken to minimize the impact of potential nuisances such as noise odor vibration um, we have in the booking instructions which I which guests must agree to before booking and in the information sheet that we email to all guests prior to their arrival and on the information sheet that we clearly post within the house we state this is a quiet family oriented neighborhood with lots of children guests are asked to please keep those children in mind while driving down the street no loud music no loud noises outdoors that could elicit complaints from neighbors no smoking no drugs including marijuana even outdoors no parties as per Anderson Township zoning, we added this afterwards. Um, guests will keep noise, odor, vibration, and dust <coughs> contained so as not to infringe upon neighbors. We've also installed two ring cameras on the property, one at the front and the other at the side, facing the garage so we can see how many people are entering the home. We also have a remote pin code doorknob which you mentioned that our adult daughter lives nearby and we can send her to the house on our behalf when necessary we list our house as a three-bedroom home suitable for six guests but we're open to allowing eight guests if it's a large family because almost everyone who rents is uh, has kids they're like family oriented they have children grandparents um, so you know it, it could be more if there's children um, the, the one that says no adverse effect, the proposed use and development shall not have an adverse effect upon adjacent property. Um, by stressing to all guests our intention for our home to be, the, before they book, we are doing absolutely everything in our power to ensure that no adverse effects will be seen by us renting short term. But we did make one um, big error with a guest on June 18th. It was we had just started and um, though our rules clearly state no parties, a mom c called me just like right before her, her listing. She was all frantic. She said she didn't realize she couldn't have a small child's birthday party for her one-year-old. She asked if she could have a couple families over and have a little kiddie pool and celebrate her child's one-year birthday. Um, I didn't even know at the time that Airbnb has a strict no parties rule and I felt sorry for her and I thought what could the harm be um, you know to have a one-year-old birthday party with a kiddie pool um, and I made that mistake and allowed her to do it and it won't happen again and the guest took advantage of the situation she put up two inflatable play structures in the backyard apparently a dunking booth was the kiddie pool that she told me about and um, and our ring camera was not working at that time. We had to get it fixed with the company, so we didn't even see this. Um, and then two days na later, a neighbor contacted us stating that he had smelled marijuana from the backyard. Police were not called, and since we were only contacted two days afterward, we were unable to do anything about it. And the guest had already checked out who we did report her to Airbnb, and I did also confront the guests with the information she vehemently denied that anybody was smoking any marijuana outside she said even a neighbor came with their children and played for a while you know blah 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 but anyway we apologized profusely to our neighbor and ensured him that it would never happen again um, and that was just a, a mistake we made you know early on um, we have a professional landscape company that comes every two weeks um, and before we left, you know, we hired them to, to cut back a lot of branches and ivy and weeds. And we also have cleaners come after every guest. They take pictures for us. They let us know if anything needs to be fixed. They let us know if anything needs, you know, attention. Um, our goal is to keep the house looking and feeling exactly as if our family were living there. We advertise it as a family home. Almost all of our guests are there with their children visiting the Ark, the Creation Museum, the aquarium, the zoo, the water park. One mom was there with her child also getting treatment from Cincinnati Children's Hospital, a little boy on a trach and respirator. Um, 
uh, grandparents, you know, bringing their children. Uh, two two women came because their mom. I mean, booked because their their mom had died. And everybody who comes, they say that the house is so peaceful. That they just have such a great feeling in the house. And we are doing everything in our power to make sure that you know this is a family oriented home. It stays that way. Um, and I can't think of anything else to say. Thank you. Are there any questions from the board? Do you self-manage the property? Yes, but I mean, we have, our, we have cleaners and we have landscapers and other, because we live in Georgia, so like we don't come to the house to do the, the stuff, but we hire people to. And you to, coordinate all those? Yeah, we coordinate the it people. Sounds like you started the Airbnb in June of this year? Yes. And where, where exactly does your daughter live? Um, she was in Amelia. She just moved even closer to our house, but I don't have her address because she just moved last week. I don't remember, but it's, she said it was closer. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, thank you. Is there anyone here who would like to speak in support of the appeal? Anyone want to speak in support of the appeal? Is there anyone who would like to speak in opposition to the appeal? Okay. Please come to the microphone, state your name, address, any affiliation, and present your appeal. Good evening. Um, Paul Buck. I live at 786 Strathcoma Drive, which is directly next door to the property for short-term rental. Um, <clears throat> Well, history, I moved here about a year and a half ago from Maryland with my wife and our three-year-old daughter, a th year and a half-year-old daughter who is now three. Um, when we moved in, that house was occupied by the former owner. Um, we picked this area um, coming from the East Coast because of the quiet family-oriented neighborhood, not knowing anybody from Ohio. Um, the rental to me has been up since May begin end of May beginning of June and living next door we notice all the foot traffic and the car traffic and there's been numerous attend uh, tenants going in and coming into our neighborhood that we do not know and in our, on our street alone there's at least a dozen kids ranging from infants to seniors in high school basketball hoops kids in the street so adding these this traffic from the tenants and the cleaning ladies and the so on other the grounds who keep the grounds um they don't know who lives there they don't know the kids they're not aware of the kids um and then not being able to know as a property owner who's staying in that house i travel for work sometimes for a week at a time i like i said i have a daughter three-year-old daughter and a wife who i'd be leaving at home next to I don't know who's living there at that point. Um, on Father's Day, she brought up, when I came home from work, there's a birthday party sign in the yard. The street's lined with cars at the end of the cul-de-sac circle. There's cars parked in between the driveways. And I go into my house, a beautiful day, windows open, and probably around 4 o'clock, my house starts smelling like marijuana. So, of course, I have a daughter. My wife says, what should we do? And I'm not one to call the cops. I'm going to go over there and see if I can handle myself. So I went over and approached the group of 10 to 12 males that were smoking marijuana and asked them respectfully to please stop or take it somewhere else. Um, my house is filling up with marijuana. Um, along with plenty of kids and other, I would say, probably 30 to 40 people at this party. Um, and they respected my, you know, my request to stop or move, which obviously ended well but not knowing how it could have ended those people would know where i live if they did not agree with me um let me see what else i have here and then i wanted to address some of her some of their notes from their letter um i know the the bza sent a letter asking them to stop operation of the rental property until the public hearing and the decision has been made whether they can continue using this as a short-term rental which my assumption was somewhere around the beginning of june which 
the property is still listed on Airbnb currently as we speak right now. The property never stopped with tenants. They came and you know kept coming every week. Every I mean sometimes multiple tenants a week. Um, there's plenty of reviews on the Airbnb listing right now from the month of July, up to seven reviews currently of people that have stayed there and given their reviews. Granted, yes, they're all great reviews for the house. The house has been great, but to my understanding, the property should not have been operating until there has been a decision here at the public hearing. Um, I also brought photos that I can pass over. Um, even with the property sign of the public hearing, there's multiple cars. I've taken pictures of cars that have been on property. And so I have to show that they've been renting this property. And they talked about the two ring cameras on the property so they can see how many people are renting the home. I know she talked about the ring camera must have been broken. I did not know this, if that's true or not. But when there's a party there that had a party rental company come the day before, set up a blow up water slide. And then the following day, like I said, over 30, 40 people coming on their property. If the cameras were working or not, they should have an idea of what's going on. They stated that they received a complaint from one of our neighbors that there was marijuana being smoked on the property. Um, and they could not do anything about that. I don't think that's our responsibility to have to report to them that something is happening at their property that shouldn't be. I think as a property manager, you should know what's happening at your property and how it's affecting the neighbors. Um, also on the Airbnb listing, the, the homeowners state that they own their own real estate company that have been in business since 2001. And this is their first Airbnb, Airbnb property and whole flow of many, which worries me in my neighborhood because the way that it's been rented, their average nightly rate is about $120 a night, which if you look at their calendar right now, you can't book a, you can't book the house until May of 2023. So obviously it's a popular property, but if you add up the cost of 30 days, 31 days, you're looking at a 3,600 to 3, $4,000 dollar profit, not including fees, um, which tells me that this is a business property that they would like to continue. Um, and when I moved to Anderson Township, I found it as a family oriented, family focused environment that I'd like to raise a family and knowing next door that I will not know my neighbors who will be at that house when possibly out of town and my family's home does not make me feel safe and the safer children playing in their yards in the street, not knowing the backgrounds of the individuals who are renting the property. And I do not know if Airbnb does background checks, if they do background checks, how that works. But I, to my understanding, they would not know the background of who is renting that property as well. And there have been plenty of rentals, tenants that have not had families due to concerts at Riverbend. We're about five minute drive from Riverbend. So we've had other younger crowds of five or six college age, 30 year olds there to go to concerts, drinking on the patio, which lines up right next to my property. Um, and that's all I have to say. I can give you guys some photos if you need them. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions from the board? No, thank you. No. Nope. Okay. Okay. Let me take a look. Give me a quick look in that. Hold on, hold on. We gotta be recognized. Okay. Okay. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in opposition? Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Please come to the podium, give your name, address, and any affiliation. 
Thank you. Uh, sure. My name is Daniel Nething. Uh, I live at 790 Sunderland, which is one street over. Uh, I have a direct line of sight on uh, the house in question. Mm -hmm. uh, I will keep this quite quick since I know my neighbors are going to be addressing their concerns about uh, maintaining sh child safety in the area and just maintaining the general feel of the neighborhood. Um, the main things that I wanted to point out, um, actually one very recent one, uh, my neighbor pointed out uh, very briefly that he travels for work. I also travel for work, and when we moved to this neighborhood, it was the expectation that it would be a very safe place with minimal turnover, with not a lot of strangers coming into the neighborhood. And frankly, based on what I know of Airbnb's business model, volume is their business model. More people in on a regular basis. So we are basically talking about whether or not we are ready to have people frequently in and out who we don't know, might be good, might be bad, we just don't know. And as a community that is very focused on raising families, having children, keeping tight personal knit with our neighbor, I mean, raise your hand if you're coming from that group. Like, we're all here because we are concerned about this. And frankly, it makes me very uncomfortable the idea that my partner will be at home directly across from a house where I don't know who's going to be there on a regular basis. Um, <clears throat> some more commercial uh, items. Uh, I would point out that there are already significant shortages of housing, both to purchase and rent in the Cincinnati area. It's a known issue. Um, I recently was contacted by my realtor saying they're looking to buy more, or they're looking to put more houses on the market because there's a three day turnover period right now between when a house goes on and when it comes out. I really would not like to lock up another property that could go to another family that wants to set down roots in Cincinnati. Um, and the last thing that I'd point out is, while yes, there is a ring camera too, uh, while yes, there are family members nearby, surveillance does not equal compliance. Um, I was in college, I stayed at a few uh, Airbnb properties early on, and I saw what happened to those properties. You, you, I behaved myself, but it was quite obvious that other people had not, and, and frankly, even having a family member nearby the proximity of the owners in Georgia, or lack thereof, uh, is concerning to me. So um, I will go ahead and see the rest of my time, but thank you for your attention and interest. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Okay. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in opposition? Please state your name, your address, and any affiliation. Um, my name is Joyce Dickinson, and I live next door at 770 Strathcoma, and we share the driveway there. And when they moved in, they were very friendly and all that, and told me of their situation with the children and all that. They brought this 20-foot RV and left it in the driveway the whole year, and that was even beyond the time when their child died in January and they left in June. And that was against the zoning thing. And I, I went along with that because the child needed it in case we had electric out and they needed the compressor on the RV. So I said, okay. But with all these people coming in and out, we are a, a cul-de-sac with a lot of small children running in the streets and having the availability playing in there and all of us neighbors are very cautious about this with the children playing in the yard and these people are coming in sometimes for rentals one two or three days sometimes there's maybe three different families or uh, people that come in with their cars from out of state and you have them at all times well, I live next door. I've been there for 54 years since the subdivision there on my street. I, I was one of the last houses on my end. So I know, and I'm the surviving person left. And we are just concerned about all this transit people coming in and all that and with the cars and such. and. I know with people going in and out and all that, and we share the 
the driveway, which is a narrow driveway there that they have to end up parking up at the top. If they parked at the bottom, they wouldn't be walking on the yard, on my, my side of the yard, too. So you have all that. And I'm just concerned that our, we're a family neighborhood and with homeowners and everything that we wouldn't, we didn't expect anybody to be coming in and having people in so frequently all the time. It's different if you have a rental for maybe a year or something like that. But all these people coming in and out every week or a couple of weeks, and then that party with a one-year-old party, and the two inflatable things that they brought in, and the, the uh, street was parked full of cars and all that. And we didn't know what was going on there. So we just are concerned about our quiet neighborhood and having all these transient people in all the time. I mean, if they knew they were going to do this after their child died, I mean, they could have at least said something to us. And they didn't say a word. All of a sudden, they disappeared. And, the, and then we started seeing all these frequent cars coming in. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was concerned about. Thank you. Is there any questions from the board? One question for you, please. Ma'am, ma'am. So if we're facing the house, which side is your house? Mine is to the right. To the right. Thank you. And I'm in the very cul-de-sac. Okay. Thank you. So. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in opposition? Please come to the podium. State your name, your address, and your affiliation. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Arjun Mohan. Um, I live at 789 Strathcoma Drive, which is right across the house. Uh, that we're talking about. Um, first of all, I really like to, from the bottom of my heart, say I'm sorry for your loss. Uh, it's not. It's something that no no parent should go through. So I want to get that out there first. Um, in case you don't know what kind of neighbors we are, we're, we're not the kind of neighbors who who sends our food back and yells at the waiters, right? We're the kind of neighbors who who you know who who'll bring you food, bake goods. That's the kind of neighbors we are. That's the kind of neighborhood we think that we we, we live in. Uh, that being said, um, it's, been, it's been a bit of chaos. I, I know I moved to Cincinnati in 14, always been, um, I moved to the country in, in, in 12, always been my dream to own a home uh, for my family, for my kids. Um, I've met my wife here, I have my kid. Um, wanted a place where you can you know, run around, everything that you would need from, from your kids and your grandkids. Uh, I feel like that's, that's being challenged a little bit. You know, it's, as you can see, we're, this is an important, important matter for us. Uh, this is work, we both work, kids in daycare, but we still you know, want to take the time out and, and get this in front of uh, your respectable members of the society that this is, this is something important and, and we hope things were different and we hope that uh, we, we could be good neighbors, but it's, it's difficult to see how that can materialize when we don't know who's, who's in our neighborhood. We don't know if we can let our kids roam free. We don't know if we can let our kids you know, shoot hoops and, and, and just be kids, really. Uh, that was the original vision when we, when we wanted to live in Anderson Township. Uh, it's, it's, it's a fine example of that kind of a culture uh, all across one of the best neighborhoods in Cincinnati. And, and you know, I wish that, that it stays that way. Um, but, but yeah, that's all, really, uh, from us. As you've heard from all the other neighbors, it's, it's, it's not rocket science. We, this is not who we thought we were, where we would end up. So, thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Thank okay. You. Right. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak in opposition? Please come to the podium. State your name, address, and your affiliation. Hi, my name is uh, my name is Keith McCarroll. I live at seven nine four Strathcoma Drive. It's two houses down from the to your facing house to the left. Not a very good speaker, so I'm just going to read from what I got. Um, first of all, thank you guys for hearing, for hearing everything that we're going to say. Um, just background, I've been involved in this community since I was 12. I went to AIR, I went to Guardian Angels, McNick, and Xavier University. I've been involved with Jersey Mike since 94. My wife has been involved since 96, and we bought, uh, we bought the store in 2006. We bought our first house together in 2004 in Withamsville. 
but we like this community so much, we brought our kids in and sent them into IHM. Our last four years at, that, at our old neighborhood, the neighborhood started to decline. We, having children there, we knew we had to leave. At our old house, we never felt safe letting our kids out front to play. Uh, when we decided to move to Anderson, we felt we were shopping around, we fell in love with this house and the cul-de-sac. What we fell in love with was, speaking from the heart now, was the, we literally looked at the house and there was kids all over playing. Um, it was great, it was perfect for us. We had kids in, our, in, our, in their age group. Um, in addition to our kids, there are a dozen or so kids on the street. In fact, kids come from around all over our neighborhood to come down and play basketball, ride bikes. Halloween is a huge event in our neighborhood. It's great. Um, having short-term renters from all over the country, as we've seen through this week, is e through, through up through this week, is extremely alarming. We are, we are back to being concerned. Sorry, I'm a little nervous. Uh, we worry about my 13-year-old daughter swinging on a rope that we put outside on a tree. However, when I see cars over the past few months go by with out-of-state plates, Tennessee, I've seen Tennessee, Michigan, uh, various states, um, I can't help but be concerned. We live in an environment where we're always on guard. We used to live in an environment where we're always on guard. We have worked hard at our store to pay off our loans to be able to put ourselves in a position where we're living in a neighborhood where we can feel safe. Our, our goal right now is to, now that we've paid off our loans, to remodel our kitchen and make this our long-term home. Now we're starting to get a little bit of reluctancy. And the reluctancy is going to be, you know, where our kids are starting to get older. I've got a kid that's 22 years old. We're talking about grandkids and that kind of stuff, you know, and they have grandkids. Our other, our other neighbors have kids that are three and four years old. Soon they're going to be opening doors and won't let their kids play in the streets. I, this is a liberty that we need to have. I, I, just, I just, I can't stress enough that the amount of work that we put in our whole life to get to this neighborhood situation is now, we're starting to feel a little bit of, you know, it's starting to get a little bit more angst. Um, and I apologize for the way I speak. Um, I just, I just think that you work so hard to minimize the situation that your kids are going to be in a, in a, be jeopardized, and now we're kind of opening the door for something that could possibly happen. Um, I think that's about all I got. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any questions from the board? Nope. nope. Okay. All right. Any other who have additional information who would like to... Uh, provide to the board in opposition. Okay, first of all, my name is Daria Durkee. I live at 842 Strathcoma Drive, which is on the other side of Asbury Hills on Strathcoma Drive. And I also would like to really express my condolences I had heard that that was the case, but your recollection, thank you for that, and I, I'm so sorry. Um, you can tell I'm a teacher because the first thing I want to do is give you a definition here of a community neighborhood. Um, it's a group of people who live close together with a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. I've lived in my house on Strathcoma Drive for 12 years. I bought into this area because it was a nice suburban neighborhood. Uh, and according to you, this is zoned residential. It had neat, well-cared for homes, it was a good place to raise children, uh, had some pretty good reviews on the school district, and it was not so bad for old folks like me. Uh, lots of fun being in such an eclectic neighborhood. But back to, the, to this B&B. &B. This is a revolving door for people who are not our neighbors in our area. And this does not a neighborhood make. This is not what I bought into. Make no mistake, 
This is a business enterprise. It's a Motel 6 at the other end of Strathcoban Drive. Most of what the other uh, opponents have said is written on my, my paper. I'm not going to reiterate it. But this is not what I bought into. I didn't buy into an area where people are going to be zipping down Strathcoma Drive with lots of little kids running around. Thank you. Any questions? 842. Mm -hmm. Any questions for the board? No, thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak in opposition to the appeal? Please come to the podium. Oh, I, I pointed to him first. Okay, all right. Speak your name, address, and your affiliation. Sorry, uh, my name is Ben Purser, uh, 802 Strathcoma, uh, just a few doors down. Uh, I will try to keep this, I, pardon my reading, but I figured that would help for uh, brevity. Uh, I'm he here also to stand opposed to the proposition put forth. Uh, when I read the owner's letter that we all received, I obviously became very sympathetic to the tragic circumstances and situation they found themselves dealing with. The idea that the house would be used as an Airbnb as opposed to selling or renting was surprising to me, uh, but I could at least understand it from the standpoint of the difficulty of maintaining two mortgages. Uh, it was the letter's implied love for the neighborhood and the idea that this was strictly uh, a proposal of a necessity that led me to hope our neighborhood would be given due respect and consideration. However, early on in the property's use as a short-term rental, uh, we all have discussed the party that happened. Uh, while the party now insists on no parties, uh, it will ultimately fall on us nearby to report if there is a party. It relies on uh, renters being honest in their intents to use the property. Um, um, excuse me. Uh, lastly, the, as has already been stated, um, the page mentions having a real estate company that the, this is the first Airbnb, hopefully, of many. Uh, and that is kind of what is unfortunately kind of led me to feel like this is being treated more as a monetary uh, situation. Uh, combining this with Airbnb's somewhat limited background check capabilities and the obvious concerns of who's staying in the neighborhood with so many children, including my own, uh, I feel I have no choice but to oppose the proposition. There's already numerous uh, Airbnb listings in Anderson, and I find it a troubling pattern to continue turning tight-knit neighborhood homes into modern-day condos with revolving door of mystery guests. Uh, while I obviously mean no disrespect to the owners, and I wish them nothing but the best, uh, I hope it is this committee's decision that we will keep our piece of Anderson full of neighbors and not strangers. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Okay. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in opposition and has new information to add? Go ahead. Do, do you want? Additional, uh, additional information. Can you give your name for the record then? Okay. okay. All right. All right. Would the appellant like to rebut any of the? We did have one other. Oh, we have another opposition. Okay. Please come to the podium. Uh, give your name, address, and your affiliation. I'm James Leland. I live at 834 Strathcoma Drive. I'm a neighbor. Okay. Um, I'm not going to say a whole lot. Um, that's been pretty well covered, uh, and also I have to pee. Um, but <laughs> I've been sitting here for a very long time, and I was drinking a soda. Um, I just wanted to say that to me, um, a rental agreement of this sort is more of a commercial issue, and that is not why I moved here. I've been here for 12 years. Um, I have an 11-year-old son who goes out in the neighborhood. I know, I believe there's at least... I know that there is at least 18 children on that street. They're all outside all the time. We all look out for each other. Um, and when there's somebody on the street that you don't know, you always look to see why they're there. And that's why we move there. That's the type of community it is. I feel like the people that come here will be parasitic to our neighborhood. Um, and I think that this is commercialism in a residential area. I don't like it. That's it. 
Okay. Thank you. And any questions from the board? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go pee now. Okay. Anyone else like to speak in opposition? Anyone else in opposition? Third time. Anyone else in opposition? Okay. Would you like to rebut any of the information that's been provided? Um, yes, just to clarify a couple of things. Um, first of all, I made a mistake. The first day it was rented was May 29th. I was thinking June, but when they said May, I, I want to clear that up. It was May 29th. That's when, we, right after we moved. Um, the ring camera, I'm not saying the ring cameras didn't work, but my husband couldn't get it on his phone. He couldn't get any um, signal on his phone. And after we got the call from the neighbor, he, was, he had to get in touch with the ring company to get fixed so that he could see. We weren't, I wasn't lying about that. Um, he had to get it fixed. As far as us doing it like a profit and making all this money, our mortgage is very high. Our utilities are very high. We haven't made any profit June or July because of, uh, we have a lot of expenses with the house and we've had to fix things with the house too. Um, the when we got the letter saying we couldn't run the airbnb i talked to brandon and i was going to cancel everybody i told him i was going to cancel everybody i blocked out all the dates that's why the gentleman said it's so popular that it's booked until next may it's because i have everything blocked so that nobody can book it but i had told brandon i was going to cancel everybody but when we went to do that we found out that we were going to have to pay a penalty per cancellation, but not only that, we were willing to do that. They were gonna, then they were going to shut it down for a year. So we thought, you know, it's going to totally defeat the purpose if we cancel all the July bookings and then they shut it down for a year. So I even talked to Brandon and I said, what should I do? I don't know what to do. Can I pay a, a penalty to the township? And he said, he told me, um, well, we'd have to go through the courts to to put it to, to stop. So, I mean, we're not going to go to court. You've already um, made that. You're already doing the application. You're already trying to get the, the permit. So it's not like we're going to go to the court right now. So, you know, because I, I told him I didn't know how I could how I could cancel and then the whole thing would be shut down by Airbnb. Um, as far as saying the first of many, we will definitely go and strike that out because definitely I don't want to deal with that anymore. I don't, I don't know. My husband had that on the profile that this might be the first of many. We're not trying to do this as a business. I don't enjoy doing this as a business. We only wanted to keep the house because it was sentimental, not, not because we wanted to make money. We're losing money or, or just breaking even. Um, as far as um, my next door neighbor on the right, we first of all, we don't share a driveway. She said that we share a driveway. We don't share a driveway. And no disrespect towards her, because she's a very nice lady, but she flies down the road all the time. And that's, the neighbors have complained about that, that say she flies, drives so fast down the street, and how unsafe it is for children. So I think it's kind of ironic for her to be worried about people you know, coming down fast. The RV, I was not aware of breaking any zoning rules by parking our RV at the end of our driveway. I didn't have any idea. I still don't think, know to this minute that that's wrong to park your, drive, your RV in the driveway. So I don't, didn't think or don't think that we were doing anything wrong. We did need the RV for a generator purposes because my son was on a lot of um, machinery f for breathing and stuff. And even once I, we lost our power, we had to get the power from the RV. And it's true that we didn't move right away after he passed away. We were in deep, deep, deep mourning. And I did not want to go back to my house in Georgia without him. I just couldn't bring myself to go back home without him and we stayed for a long time and I didn't know it was a problem to have my RV um, down there in the driveway um, 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 I, 
she said, why did we just leave without saying anything to anybody? Why didn't we tell any of our neighbors that we were going to do an Airbnb? And, and I heard somebody say, we're so close, and we bring each other food, and, and this is a place of fellowship, uh, so fellowship uh, in the neighborhood. Let me tell you, I did not ever get that impression. I'm not angry with anybody. I don't dislike anybody. But when we moved here at the end of October, we met five specific neighbors close by and we told them why we were there and we told them we were here from Georgia we didn't have any family here nobody that we know our son very sick needing a heart and a lung transplant on machinery in a wheelchair on oxygen people our neighbors knew this not once not once ever did anybody ever ask us how is our son How's your son doing? Is your son okay? Not once did anybody ever knock on our door, offer us anything, bring us anything. I'm not saying they have to, but to say this is the type of neighbors we are. Nobody once asked us a single, inquired about our son one time. Even a neighbor once came to our door to complain that we had moved some old branches in the wrong spot, which I moved them right away as soon as he told me. He came to the house. He didn't even ask us, how's your son? Nobody ha had asked us, inquired, talked to us, never, not one time. And I'm not saying like I'm doing this in revenge to anybody, but I was, it was so uncomfortable for me to go then to my neighbors who have never talked to me once when they knew I had a like dying son and then go and talk, oh, hi, my son died and I'm going to do an Airbnb. You know, it was awkward for me. I'm not that outgoing of a person. I didn't know how to go and talk to people and tell them I don't like to talk about it. So I'm not going to go and tell people who haven't even spoken to me in all the seven or eight months that I was there and tell them and tell them my plan because nobody talked to us the whole time we were there. Um, I, I mean, honestly, I figured, like, I don't know, I mean, you could just ignore the the people we we see the people we talk with the people who are coming to the house i think um they all seem like very nice sweet kind people i, I mean i understand neighbors not wanting to have an airbnb airbnb i totally understand it i i can understand everybody's concerns um i we adopted nine kids we have a lot of kids um, they're mostly all grown now, but I mean, I, I've raised kids from orphanages and from foster care. I don't leave my kids to play out on the street and worry about what the neighbors might do to them. I always watch my kids. Like I never would just leave my kids to be outside, so I'm watching my kids. I don't know all of my neighbors in Georgia, and, I, and people move in and out, and I don't know them all, but I'm responsible for watching my kids. And that's how I always have been. I, you know, I'm, I'm not thinking who, who's here, who's there, who's there. You know, I'm just in charge of watching my children. Um, I don't remember if there was anything else that I wanted to clarify from, you know, what anybody said. I do understand, you know, how how people f feel and. You know, if we need to sell the house, we need to sell the house. But um, at least if you guys don't give us the permission, we would at least, you know, at least like to be able to keep doing it until we can sell it because I don't want to go into like a foreclosure because I cannot pay for two um, mortgages. And I don't, I don't know what the, what, what kept coming up with us having being real estate agents in Georgia? I don't remember what that, what that was related to, here, and what that has to do with, or what the concern was, or anything. Um, but anyway, that's why we kept um, running the Airbnb this month because I really didn't know what to do. And, and it, is, it is totally blocked, and that's why you know, it looks like it's booked until next year. It's just because we blocked all the dates so we wouldn't get any more um, bookings. We thank you. Is there any questions or comments from the board? Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in support and add additional information? 
Is there anyone else who would like to speak in opposition and add additional information? Hearing no further comments, and if there's no objection of the board, do we have a motion to close the public hearing on this case? So moved. Second. Is there a second? Will you read the roll? Mr. Lawrence? Aye. Mr. Sion? Aye. Mr. Haber? Aye. Mr. Halpin? Aye. Mr. Sheckles? Aye. Okay. Um, let me, I should have done this in open session, but since we're sitting here in front of everybody, uh, we need to understand that we are the Board of Zoning Appeals. We are not the zoning board. We do not pass any zoning regulations for this township. We have no input into any zoning regulations in this township. Our purpose is to deal with situations that fall out of the typical zoning items and come to uh, a decision about relief or address or whatever. Okay, but just so everyone on the board here knows, we don't pass any of these regulations and have influence in any of them. So that said, uh, who would like to lead off the conversation? So then why is this in front of us? Because we are the Board of Zoning Appeals. We do not, we do not vote on any zoning regulations, John. Well, I'd just like to clarify a couple of things. So this is a conditional use with an associated variance. So all conditional uses are reviewed and approved by the board to make sure that you feel like the intent of the conditional use is being met. There are four standards that you would review this conditional use, which are in the staff report, and then the other standards for a variance. So the the four particular standard general considerations are spirit and intent, no adverse effect, protection of public services, and consistent with adopted township plans. So it is a little bit different than your standard variance, um, but the board has the authority to approve and deny conditional uses. Right. And also place other conditions as they feel appropriate if they do approve them. Right, but the actual regulation itself is no relationship to this board correct the adoption of the resolution was by the township trustees yeah all right um, this is the second uh case we had a case what three two or three months ago yeah another similar period. situation uh and there was very much similar in the support and the defense and the opposition okay uh, when i look at the driveway issue and i was when i visited the site i drew a vertical line i stood on the driveway I drew a vertical line from the house to the property line and looked at the paved area in the back and it appeared to me that you could put three cars in that area it's a double car garage in the back with a swing out turn area. Okay, so I believe three cars could fit in that area. Uh, someone else have any comments? So with, re with regard to the parking, I would accept if we could draw that vertical line from the house to the property line and parking behind it, okay? Could the staff forward us to those the pictures of the driveway, please? Yeah. You see, you can, yeah, you can see can where the see RV the, was. Yeah. Okay, so you drove, go to the front and you draw a vertical line across there. And so when you're walking back there, that's a double garage. There are three cars there right now, too. You can see yeah, the Yeah, but they're in the front. So you're saying three can park in the back? I, I don't see why three cars couldn't park in that back area, because that is a two-car garage. So you can put two in front of the garage and one where the RV is. So as far as the parking issue, that's my thoughts.
Mr. Chair, I'm going to state what I stated at our last consideration. I think it was over on Collinsdale. Yep. Uh, when I look at the standards here, no adverse effect. The proposed short-term rental would not have an adverse effect upon adjacent property or the public health, safety, and general welfare. The applicant uh, has indicated, even though there are ring doorbells, there are rules to address noise, odor, vibration, and dust, and so on uh, in the booking instructions, and yeah, they must be agreed to. Um, but I believe we've received testimony today that uh, whether or not those have been violated or whether the actual aspect of a short-term rental uh, is what's of concern concerns me. Um, when I look down here with the consistent with the adopted township plans, um, Anderson Township is home to diverse housing options to meet changing demographics and market demands. The, the, the next one is, the next statement is what I um, uh, a, a, am concerned about, which is encourage the development and redevelopment of a variety of housing styles and densities in appropriate areas of the township. The property is designated for a single family residential use on the future land use map and staff has gone on record in saying that it's consistent with the use classification. I was uh, opposed to our earlier consideration uh, because of this will change the neighborhood. Um, I appreciate all of the testimony here tonight and as I reflected back at that meeting a couple months ago um, I, I have a long-term rental across the street and it's just changed hands it's just changed renters to it and uh, it's a long-term rental and I had to call up staff because when the former renters moved out they left about 40 cubic yards of trash in the front yard that sat there for about three days until the owner came uh, so uh, I, I am alarmed at this I am alarmed uh, y yes there are er there are areas that are appropriate for the township to do this but I, I I am not in favor of supporting I wasn't then and I'm and I'm, I have not been convinced now that granting this conditional use is the right thing to do so Steve are you saying that in general for Airbnbs or this specific unit no that's why I was that's why I was clear in my final statement there encourage the development and redevelopment of a variety of housing styles and densities in appropriate areas of the township that's fine I don't believe in single family communities like this that this is an appropriate area there may be other areas that are appropriate but I am not convinced that this is an appropriate area I think that term was in there purposefully what would you consider appropriate well it's probably probably based on density I mean I've stated I've stated an Airbnb mm -hmm. down in Pigeon Forge up on the side of a mountain and you couldn't see the next one next to you mm -hmm. probably an appropriate place for an Airbnb 
uh, but it wasn't in the middle of a residential community. Okay, but we're not dealing with Pigeon Ford. We're dealing with the Anderson Township map. Where in Anderson? No, I understand that. that. So where in Anderson and, and Township and is it appropriate? That's why I would ask. There may be places that it's appropriate. Certainly, we have. Um, communities that have larger lot sizes and I think it would be based on density as to whether or not it's appropriate this is a this is a this is a thing single family residential neighborhood well Paul and, and, and I'm, I'm 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 only reiterating because I'm maintaining what my position right. was, I know that's what we earlier. talked about in Collinsdale yeah yeah well, Paul, is there any restriction in the zoning regulation as far as where this can be in Anderson Township? The, no. So it's a conditional use in a single-family zoning district, in any single-family zoning district. But I think, you know, to answer your question and, and to touch on what Mr. Haber was saying as well, um, if you don't think this is an appropriate location, why? What makes this stand out different? You know, what, what are the specific characteristics of this street, this neighborhood, that it wouldn't be appropriate as far as it may be a different single family? You know, what are, what are the characteristics that, that fall within um, these standards? Spirit intent, no adverse effect, protection of public services, and consistent with adopted, adopted township plans based off of the applicant's testimony as well as the neighborhood testimony. So I think it's not one size that fits all throughout the township. Yes, They're permitted in any single family zoning district, no matter what the actual lot size is, but there are different, each, each request is going to be site specific and you'll need to make a determination if it fits within those conditional right. standards. But there's no specific, that's what I'm, there's nothing They're specific. They're permitted in any single family that's zoning what I, district. That's what I was yeah. looking for. So okay. regardless of his zone C, which is a minimum of 6,000 square foot lots to AA, which is over an acre, they're permitted in any, but right. you need to right. hone that, in on this particular right. location. Right, okay. And I don't think we can compare township wide. Yeah, okay, yeah. thanks. No. Just time to get some clarity for, for everybody. Okay. John, what are your thoughts? I think the uh, use of the property has been abusive. And I think it's been lack based on evidence that, that it's uh, not been maintained properly as an Airbnb and been allowed to get out of hand. And I don't think it's fair to the neighbors that it doesn't, it isn't maintained in a fashion that would be consistent with a community mm -hmm. environment. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I want that next door to me. And I don't know if that's the right thing to say, but that's, you know, <coughs> just doesn't sound fair to the neighborhood mm -hmm. to me. I mean, I understand what an Airbnb is because I've, running them myself all over the place. But long and short is, is that this sounds more like people run it for the purpose of partying. Mm -hmm. Partying isn't uh, a, a neighborhood thing. Mm -hmm. That's my thought. Paul, give us your thoughts. I would counter that partying thing is that recent, you know, Airbnb has had that issue in the, in the problem and, and from the real estate perspective, you can't call it Airbnb, it's short-term rentals, there's there's VRBO, there's Airbnb, there's doctors and nurses, there's programs that you know, work through hospitals. So it's not necessarily just Airbnb, but uh, Airbnb is one specific, they did ban parties. I mean, the, the, the owner did mention they, they had a mistake with uh, allowing a short-term renter to, to have a party, which, you know, that's, I've been in similar situations where tenants are, you know, complaining they need something X, Y, Z. It's, you know, you kind of make that judgment spur of the moment. It's not always right. But in terms of, uh, you know, I, I do follow along with Mr. Haber's, you know, being in a specific area. I don't know that we need to speculate. That's not our position to speculate on that. That's, you know, that's ultimately we're, as Mr. As Paul had said, uh, Mr. Shekels had said, uh, that we are 
we rule on existing regulations, existing laws. Existing regulations, existing laws are made by higher up. You know, short of me going out and saying it, probably getting fired from the board over here, but it's not our purview and somebody else needs to make that decision. And I'm pretty sure everybody here knows that, you know, who needs to make that decision and who, who needs to be leaned on in order to, to make that, you know, 100% one way or the other. Right. I mean, are there areas and avenues? I mean, we're trying to develop, uh, you know, the, you're on the transportation committee as well, and you know the, the Kellogg Avenue, there is a big development area there, and yeah. so there's argument to be made, it's suitable there. Same time too, I mean, the language here, to me, is, is open. I mean, we can't go on fact by fact situation, and we did approve one a couple months ago, and it's in a, almost a similar location. I think the difference with this is this is a end of a cul-de-sac, and that one I think was on a on a residential street at the same time too, but not necessarily the end of the cul-de-sac. I don't know that we can use hang our hat on that though. No, I, and to the fact that you know we are put in a very difficult position by the zoning regulations as they exist, because listening to what has been said for Mr. Brewery in it, you know we are given the responsibility of going neighborhood by neighborhood and suggesting it's okay here and it's not okay here but then two blocks over it's okay and three blocks over it's not and it's a very difficult position to be put in Scott give us your thoughts well I'm kind of in the mindset that, you know, it's it's something that's coming, Airbnbs or whatever, short-term rentals are becoming more and more popular. They're going to get more and more, and no matter, like you said, no matter where they are, you're not going to determine, you can't say this subdivision is for short-term rentals and this one's not. Or, you know, it's, it's, it's going to happen in probably most of the communities in Anderson. Um, can't really control who rents it. You sign a contract that says, you know, I'm going to behave, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that, but you know how that goes depending on who gets it. It can be with anything, same as a long-term rental property. Mm -hmm. You know, they sign a co contract that they're going to maintain it, and a year later you got 40 cubic yards of junk in your front yard. And that so, was for a long-term rental. <laughs> long-term, right. So, I mean, you know, you go short-term rental and over a weekend you your house is trash with holes in the wall and parties and everything else. So, I mean, we can't really control that. Um, so, I just uh, at one side, I feel for people who live on the street, and on the other side, you know, it's um, kind of feel for the owners as well because they're just trying to make a buck. So, I'm kind of in the middle. I'm not sure what to do with it. And I, I'm having the same quandary in my mind, you know, if this were two blocks over, would this be okay? Uh, you it know, it would be a different group of people. It would be a just different group of people right. arguing the same argument, you know. And unfortunately, the zoning regulation puts us in this position of trying to interpret what was meant by this statement. What statement? That it's appropriate. What right. is appropriate? Right. What's the appropriate neighborhood? What's the appropriate house? What's the appropriate street? Mm -hmm. Some would say everything's appropriate. <laughs> Some would say nothing's appropriate. I think it has to do with management. If it's managed appropriately, then it's appropriate. If it's not managed appropriately, it's not appropriate. And in this case, it appears not to have been managed appropriately. In my opinion. Did That's you say that because of the one party? I'm saying it uh, not just based on the one party, but based on a lot of the other uh, comments made as well. The, the fact that you have a lot of people coming in, going, driving fast, not respecting the, the community, and, 
and I think the lack of respect is uh, consistent with uh, people coming to town for a short purpose, like going to a concert down at mm -hmm. Riverbend. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's all well and good that we have the offering of uh, short-term properties, but the long and short of it is that there's a responsibility, and the responsibility is to manage it. And when it isn't managed properly, then it's not fair to the community and shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. That's my thought. Managed properly, the neighbors wouldn't have a problem. Well, no matter what, we could have that hypothetical argument. Mm -hmm. If I could rent it to X, and X would be fine one day, and I rent it to Y, and Y would be an absolute jerk and trash and party and be all over the neighborhood and crazy. So what is the, what was what was bad management and what was good management? Because in those two, how would how would I have known that this guy was going to do this and this guy wasn't going to do this? Well, you wouldn't. The, I guess what it comes down to is response. Mm -hmm. If your response is, if you're in, in a position to be able to respond to an inappropriate behavior in a short order, then you can correct that short, uh, that inappropriate behavior. But if you're not able to respond, then that inappropriate behavior moves forward as much as it wants. And then when you do become aware, it's already too late to manage it. Mm -hmm. so that's just my just to roll it back a little bit, uh, you're in your position that uh, it, it's not managed properly. So basically, going back to our standards to be considered, I'm looking at the, the one through four. Your position is that it does have an adverse effect. In this particular case, yeah. How about any of the other uh, items in that in that uh, the one through four? And I guess just to kind of bring us to a head, I mean, that all the board members should look at those standards. And so and there are four standards, and then there are also the conditional use criteria. So some of the conditional use criteria do speak to some of the items that you're discussing as well. So if you feel that the conditional use, if the application doesn't meet the criteria or if it doesn't meet those four standards or vice versa, you feel that it was sufficient and it does meet, that's how you know, we can make a decision. You know, I think, in my opinion, spirit, protection, and consistent, I believe this is with those three. No adverse effect is, is the one party an anomaly? Is the one party, you know, a symbol of something else has gone on? Or, you know, the property is ex very well maintained landscaped very well. If, if we deny them and they wanted to keep the keep the, the house, I mean, they could always convert to a long-term rental. They don't necessarily have to sell it. I don't know what the definition is, you know, where you break that down between short-term rental versus you've got those long-term corporate housing. I know in the past I've had neighbors who are corporate tenants and they're P and G comes and rents out the house, and they're there for years at a time. Is there any regulation if uh, someone would come to them and say, "Well, I want to rent this for a year"? So our, our definition is uh, for short term rental is 30, 30 days. days. So okay, all right. That would meet the criteria for short term rental. Anything other than that would not be regulated. Would not be regulated as long as the house is being used as a single family home. Okay, so I, I conceivably could rent my house to someone for a year, two years, and as long as it's well maintained on the outside, it's out of the it's out of the re, out of the control of Anderson Township. As long as the home is being used for a single family home. Okay. Okay. I think we're all 
all just in the same quandary, <laughs> you know. Oh. Well, to me, it comes down to whether or not whether or not changing the dynamic of the residents provides any potential adverse effect. And whether or not this particular housing style is appropriate given the situation. Is it given the situation or the Well, where it's yeah. located. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it could be, there's other properties with greater, uh, 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 other residential areas of less density. But the regulation doesn't say anything about density. That's why if we had a short-term rental conditional use request in a place that was highly less dense and we didn't have a, a, the significant amount of the community coming out and expressing their concern, would we say that that's appropriate? Well, we had a similar situation that with the, the community response in the other property, right. and yet we approved them. I voted no. I know. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying, you know, was this almost a, yeah. a mirror situation of this? Right. You know. Right. But I think it was brought out that uh, we, we really, really didn't have any say in the whole thing to begin with. And so that's why I think that we went ahead and went with it. Yeah, and I mean, a motion was made, and we decided to vote on it to see where it where it fell out, and I think that's where we're kind of getting to at this point as well, too. Um, I mean, we're 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 looking at it from a zoning point of view, and yet there were other extenuating circumstances in the previous case which included uh, a local owner there were at least if i remember three different electronic devices one including that if noise got above a certain decibel unit that the owners were notified which I, which I haven't seen here, uh, that may have promulgated the... The, the party issue. <laughs> the, 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 the neighborhood issue, yeah. I mean, if, if, if they had had that, that party that, was, that occurred here before, they would have known it in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. Would, are you saying you'd accept this? I didn't accept it then. I know. I, I, okay. So then that's a mute point if you want to argue that it's an important part, but you won't accept it either way. No, I'm just describing some of the extenuating circumstances right. that may have led to the decision, the, the, the earlier decision that would potentially mitigate it. But I don't think it's an appropriate use for the neighborhood. Okay. forward somehow so I I think again if you feel that the application does not meet the specific conditional use criteria um, that can be used in your decision or again if you feel that it does meet the criteria then that can be part of your decision and again the four different um, uh, criteria and, and just for clarification so the last one consistent with adopted township plans staff picked out those articles of our comprehensive plan that's not in the zoning resolution that was in the comprehensive plan so that doesn't mean that there isn't additional information in the comprehensive plan to support or not support the request for a conditional use so those were the two items out of the comprehensive plan out of the housing chapter that we felt were applicable in this particular situation but they're not in the zoning resolution that's the difference okay. well completely not a motion but I would support this with some conditions 
that's my my opinion right now. I would support the appeal, and the conditions would be the parking would have to be resolved, and I would uh, consider the noise monitoring system similar to the other one as another consideration. That's where I fall right now. Anyone else want to say where they fall? John, do you want to, or does anybody else want to tell us where they fall, or does anyone else want to put a resolution uh, up to vote? Let's put something up. I think I would agree with what you said with some resolutions. With some conditions? Yeah, additional conditions? conditions. conditions. Oh, you know. well, I'll start a motion. Okay, go ahead, Paul. Mr. Chair, in regards to case number 21-2022-BZA, I move that we approve a conditional use and variance request to allow a short-term rental at 778 Strathcoma Drive. As part of those, uh, part of the approval, we would like to set some conditions. Uh, Mr. Chair, could you share those conditions again? I would incorporate those conditions. Well, the condition about parking being on a line parallel with from the front of the house to the property line as you face it on the right, and only three cars maximum in the, in the area. I would accept that. Okay. Ed, and put that you, in your... Just okay. for clarification, so are you saying behind... The draw, draw line parallel from that corner right where you are. Yes, okay. Uh, parallel with the front of the house here. No, uh, to the property line, okay? And only three cars, so they have to be in that area. Okay. What other conditions do you think we should include? The other condition being that sound monitoring technology, device, equipment, what, what have you. A remote, a, a sound monitoring system that would send a remote signal to the owner. Correct. That immediately monitors for when parties. It's violated. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. That monitors for parties, excess noise, whatnot, that, uh, that this board is considered. I know there are, there are a common system out there. Yeah. There's multiple yeah. brands that do that. Yeah, that, that this board is considered in a past case that that be, that be, uh, added to the plans uh, I don't know would, would staff be getting plans for this or what what would they be getting exactly no we won't get plans we'll get, you'll just get compliance right? this is what we've done to comply with this correct that they that the owner must provide provide such information the, as to what yeah, system they're going to adopt a, a, a sound monitoring system that will provide instantaneous uh, notification, notification to the owner of sound levels what he said and i don't want to i don't want to specify a brand but it's, yeah, it's a common yeah unit out there and i'll stand at that with any with my motion any friendly amendments are appreciated um we discussed the parking um, I would uh, also consider limiting the number of people uh, and to, I believe, the appellant. Uh, they, they, they allow up to eight. Uh, is Can you make that the max? as a max occupancy at any time and now that means occupancy of the house not that you know two other people couldn't come over and visit them and leave but maximum people sleeping in the unit at one time would be eight 
and ask staff, is that something that's within our purview? Can we do that? I think we would take a straw vote and then whatever the resolution is of the board, we would present it to our re attorney re for review and then the approval, attorney and and approval at a later okay. meeting. Okay. So uh, I'll accept that amendment. Uh, the eight. The eight. Limit of eight. Limit of eight. Okay. Do you have any other considerations that anybody else wish to put into this? Any other stipulations that anyone wants to put into this? Is there a second to the motion? I second. Okay. Will you call the roll? Mr. Aye. Mr. Aye. Mr. Aye. Nay. Mr. Halpin? Nay. Mr. Shepard? Aye. Uh, the, this document will be run, uh, run by the township attorney for review and comment and then they will contact you regarding the results of the conversation with the township attorney. Well, what, what will happen is our attorney will review a draft resolution and then that will be for consideration by this board at the next meeting, which is September the 1st. After that decision is made, either party, any party affiliated with the case can appeal, so. Appeal the decision. It's yeah, appealable to the Court of Common Pleas. Appeal, but you could appeal to the Court of Common Pleas. And, but the decision yeah, has yeah. to be made first, and that won't be made until September the 1st. Okay. All right. Will you please read the staff summary for case 22-2022? Uh, Article 5.4 I-15 of the zoning resolution. And the definition of an accessory apartment is a single dwelling unit apartment intended for use as a complete independent living facility that is in the same structure as, under the same ownership as, and subordinate to a resident constructed as a single family residence and with one of the two dwelling units occupied as the principal residence of the owner. So similar to the last case, this is a conditional use approval. Um, this type of use is permitted in any single family zoning district, provided that the conditions are met and approved by the Board of Zoning Appeals. In addition, um, they are requesting a variance for a side yard setback of 10.82 feet, or 25 feet for principal structure is required in the AA zoning district. Again, the applicant is proposing to create an accessory apartment. So there is an existing detached garage and the proposal is to attach it to the main house and then build the accessory, uh, do an addition to the detached garage to create the accessory apartment. Uh, currently the detached garage does meet setbacks for an accessory structure, but with the addition, it would not meet the setback for principal structure. The house was built in 1977 and the current owners purchased the property in September, 2021. Um, the garage was built in 2002, I'm sorry, the fence was built in 2002 and the garage was built in 2017. Um, in March 2022, the applicant submitted plans for conditional use for a granny cottage, the same concept except a granny cottage is not connected to the house, an accessory apartment is connected to the house. So that's the difference. They're both conditional uses and the reason um, of the switch to attach it to the house deals with the on-site septic system and meeting public health regulations. So this is the site in question. It's located on Asbury Road. As you can see from the Cages map, the house and the detached garage. This is the aerial, the topography map. This is the proposed addition, which is a screen porch um, and then this is the existing garage, which would also be converted to the accessory apartment. 
Um, not all of the existing garage would be part of, some of it would remain a garage and then the remainder would be the accessory apartment. This is the area for the side yard setback that is requested now that all the structure would be connected as one principal structure. These are some of the elevation drawings and then the proposed floor plan of the covered outdoor living area, which is the addition connecting the two, and then the accessory apartment. These are the site photos looking at the front elevation um, facing Asbury of the garage, the detached garage. The side yard setback area of, um, again, it's compliant now because it's accessory, um, but it would not be compliant as a, attached to the principal structure. These are just print, uh, pictures of the backyard. This is behind the garage where the, um, well, this is the area where the screen porch would be. This is the area of the garage, the back of the garage. So again, it, with a conditional use, um, we look at the specific criteria and also the spare intent, um, those four standards that we focused on earlier with the other requests. Um, staff felt that this was uh, within the spare intent of the zoning district. We did not feel that it would have an adverse effect on the neighborhood. Um, as far as the setback goes to the garage, it, it is an existing garage and that the setback will not change um, the front of the garage will also still look like a detached garage. Um, the majority of the other addition, the screen porch addition, will be behind the house and not visible from the street. Um, it's in an area that is located, we feel like it would have a minimal impact on the area. And we feel it is consistent with township adopted plans, which again are some of the same um, goals uh, in the housing chapters what we used before encourage the development of a variety of housing options options at varying price points to attract and retain a diverse population so the specific criteria letter m no exterior alterations uh, shall be made that depart from the residential character we feel that this is compliant um, P1 uh, signage, there is no signage being proposed. Q, is, is it subordinate to the principal permitted use? And it is, it is subordinate in size and in area. And letter Y, the intensity of the use shall be evaluated with regard to location, size, and configuration of the, of the track. Um, staff was of the opinion that it was compliant with this finding as well. And these are the findings for the variance to setback, which we have already somewhat discussed as well. So I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Any questions from the board? No. Okay. All right. Would the appellant or the appellant's representative please come to the podium, speak into the microphone, state your name, address, and your affiliation. Good evening. Um, I'm Ryan Beal with Beal Brothers Contracting. Uh, our business is located at 6631 in uh, Stockton, Stockton Road in Fairfield. I am the contractor for the Replogle family uh, on this proposed project. Okay. Could you repeat that address again? Uh, 6631 Stockton Road in Fairfield, Ohio. Thank you. Uh, all don't have an easy job, that's for sure. Um, I just wanted to go over a few things. Uh, thank you. The, the staff did an amazing job of, of, I think, capturing everything that uh, we felt was important. A uh, few little highlights that I would like to just go over. Uh, we do feel that, uh, you know, looking at the standards that this needs to uh, conform to, that standard number five, we just want to bring to everyone's awareness that uh, the property was indeed purchased with the knowledge of the zoning. Uh, kind of the conditions and the information that has changed is uh, Sherry's father. Um, uh, his health began to decline after they took occupancy of the home. So the, the purpose of the project, which you have noted in here, is to care for Sherry's father uh, and bring that family together. Uh, the standard number six, uh, just a little bit of information on that. We were kind of going this route for a couple of reasons, but uh, the most primary of them all is uh, the EPA testing requirements were uh, very intense and lengthy, 
And uh, given uh, that there's a certain urgency with uh, caring for Sherry's father and getting me here, uh, that was one of the reasons we chose to uh, look at this a different way as opposed to a granny cottage. Uh, there are one other thing uh, you had noted on here that uh, kind of the change that we made to the different sides of the structure. Uh, the design for the uh, sexual apartment hasn't been completely flushed out yet. And one of the things I did want to make sure and just be very upfront about is that on the side that we're asking for the variance on, being as there will be a bedroom that will be required to be in an apartment uh, to house Sherry's father, we may need to put some windows on that side. Uh, again, it will conform with the house and it will be residential in nature, but that just wasn't noted and I didn't want that to come up as a potential surprise later on. Uh, and, and indeed, there will be no changes to the, the garage, the, the Asbury side. Uh, so pretty much, the you know, we did have one person that was here in support, Josh and Jerry, which are the neighbors in back. They ended up having to leave uh, due to the length of the meeting. Uh, but they are the neighbors directly to the rear of the Rupogel family. And the only thing uh, I want to make sure is I could answer any questions that uh, you would have. Uh, this is for a, a little different structure, obviously, because you're going to be a co you're going to be a enclosed structure, correct? Yeah. The um, the porch structure. Yeah, you say proposed covered outdoor living area. Yeah, so that's the 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 area between the house and the garage is is going to be a, oh, okay. uh, a porch my, structure the, a port, like a roof covering yeah my my mistake okay yes you're taking the the apartment is going to be in the garage okay. yeah the yeah. the front half of the garage is going to remain no. a garage the back half is you're good it wasn't uh, okay. there on me <laughs> so exterior modifications to the garage you're still flushing out because of the layout of the apartment um uh, but additional windows uh on the uh, side facing away from the current structure uh, yes so the side that we're asking for the variance on uh, you know may uh, have windows uh, if we're allowed to do so uh, I did speak with my client and she's more than happy to provide screening if that's a requirement to be able to get the windows but just to make it feel you know light and as it should uh, and then you know the other sides are are going to be modified as 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 the staff had indicated in the report okay so there'll be maybe an additional window on on the the side to our right as we're looking at this drawing correct uh depending on your uh yes per, yes yes yeah okay. i would i would say right. probably two would yeah. be my guess well will there be a bathroom facility here or is uh, strictly yes uh there'll be a a bathroom bedroom and uh, a kitchenette sands a stove. Okay, all in that same, air, you're not changing the square footage, you're just changing the arrangement inside? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah. the, the outside dimensions are not changing, the configuration inside could change, will change. Yes, the outside dimensions will not change, okay. yes. All right. I don't have any further questions. Anybody else have any questions? Okay. Okay, thank, thank you. you for your time. Is there anyone who would like to speak in support? Is there anyone who would like to speak in opposition? Anyone who speaks in opposition? Okay. All right. Uh, any further questions from the board before I go? Okay, hearing no further comments, no objection. Do we have a motion to close the public hearing so in moved. this case? Second. Second. Can we read the roll? Aye. Mr. Zion? Aye. Mr. Haber? Aye. Mr. Halpin? Aye. Mr. Shekels? Aye. Uh, someone like to comment? Very similar to the case we had up at the Tome residence up in Raglan when he um, took a garage, uh, which was, I think, a two story garage, and put the uh, apartment upstairs and had to connect it in much a similar fashion. Um, what I like about this is um, even though the use is being changed, there's no further encroachment outside of the existing footprint. Um, 
we don't have anybody in opposition. I think the, uh, you know, certainly a, 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 a nice improvement and probably the smartest way to, smarter way to go about it given uh, giving sewer concerns. So I'd be in favor of granting it. John? Said. Paul? Concur. Agree. Do we have any conditions we need to put on this? Uh, do you want uh, something about vegetative screening if a window goes on that side or you want to just go with it? I would, I would just go with it. Okay, so I need a motion. Uh, Mr. Chair, regarding case number 22-2022-BZA, I move that we grant a conditional use permit for an accessory apartment. Um, so I'm going to, as I always do, include staff's summary um, ba -ba -ba -ba, I'm still going through conditions. Uh, 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 conditions include substantial conformance with the drawings dated July 14th, 2022. Um, construction started within one year and completed within two years. And, and forgive me, because I know we've got a variance request here, too. So do we, 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 do, we do those separately or do them, uh, do them together? Just different findings for the variance, which oh. you can, uh, yes, include that in your Okay, motion. so I'm gonna, I'll, I'll stop there. We'll make another motion for the variance. We can vote on the whole thing. We can, oh. do, a, we can do a one. Okay, so then I'm going to grant the 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 variance request for the location of the apartment um, to the side yard um, in that uh, because of the existing conditions the variance is is not substantial um, the essential character is not going to be substantially altered uh, everything of the construction is going to be contained within the existing footprint of the house and garage. Uh, not going to affect delivery of governmental services. Um, the owner's predicament really cannot be feasibly obviated through some other method other than this. And the spirit and intent behind the zoning requirement is going to be observed and justice done by granting the variance. I'll second the motion. Will you read the roll? Mr. Aye. Mr. Sion? Aye. Mr. Haber? Aye. Mr. Howell? Aye. Uh, Mr. Shaw? Aye. Uh, staff will contact you when this is available for you, okay? Uh, you're free to, free to go. Okay. All right. Well, we assume all the rest of you are here for one particular, <laughs> the, the last one. <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, will you read the uh, uh, staff summary for case 23-2022? All right, thank you for your patience. Um, the applicant is Kevin Sheehan, president of Hilltop Basic Resources, Inc., who's the property owner. Located at 6777 Kellogg Avenue, the zoning is H Riverfront, and the request is a use variance request for the construction and operation of a temporary concrete mixing plant where such a use is not permitted in the H zoning district. So uh, on the proposed development, the applicants are proposing the operation of a temporary mixing plant. Um, there is a mixing, what we call it, plant area that includes a 40 by 8 control container and then the mixing plant is separate uh, and the mixing plant is approximately 73 feet tall. The area would be the mixing plant area which contains the container and the actual plant, uh, mixing plant itself is located generally in the same vicinity as previous um, temporary batch plants and we'll look at the site plan in just one second. Um, the reason for this request it would, it's a temporary location while Hilltop is being uh, is vacating their downtown location 
and relocating to a permanent location at the request of Hamilton County and this is to make way for facilities supporting the Bengals and the construction of an indoor practice facility. Uh, it would only be temporary while the new facility or the new uh, permanent location is constructed. Um, they could be ready to install as early as mid-November but no timeline has been um, provided as far as how long it would be the temporary nature if it would be a year 18 months two years how long the applicant also submitted information about truck gener truck traffic generated uh, which is proposed to enter the site from east on state route 52 and exit the site going in the same direction it's also in close proximity to the i-275 52 interchange So there have been previous approvals by the board, use variance approvals for this site. Um, they've been in operation since 1985 and previous approvals, um, you can see, were 1992, 2002, 2005. This is the site in question. It's on the south side of Kellogg and it's directly um, across from Five Mile Road. This is the aerial of the site in question. Again, this is Kellogg, this is Five Mile. Um, their current operations are barge loading area on the river here. Um, this area is uh, not necessarily moved for, or used for the operations. This is their wheel wash system here uh, for trucks uh, exiting the site. Whoops, sorry, I went too far. Um, but the, the temporary plant area would be generally in this location. This is the topography of the map in, in question. It is in the flood plain and portions are in the flood way. <clears throat> so again, it stated this is the area uh, for the mixing plant. The container is, or, sorry, I'm getting confused. One is the container, one is the plant itself. These are site photos looking at the site from Five Mile Road. Um, this is the main entrance into the site. Back in this area is the wheel wash area. And as you can see, there is existing mature vegetation, so it is difficult to see back into the site from Kellogg. As you could see from the aerials, um, I mean, these are existing aggregate piles, but they're not visible from Kellogg during the winter time. I mean, during the summertime. <clears throat> this is a picture of the main drive and the wheel wash area. These are just site photos, the piles of aggregate that are currently there. The conveyor belts that are on site. Sorry, I'm going through them pretty fast, but. That's okay. It looks like an aggregator storage area, <laughs> so. Again, with this, it is a use variance, which is slightly different than an area variance. Um, there are um, standards to determine whether a use variance is appropriate and all four standards must be met. Um, so staff findings, um, staff is of the opinion that there are exceptional and extraordinary circumstances that apply to this property that do not necessarily apply to other properties in this area. Again, it's been in operation since 1985. There have been temporary batch plants there before, um, and those have run well. The site is kept um, clean with the wheel wash system, and it is in close proximity to 275. Um, the sur special circumstances or conditions do not result from accidents of the property owner or any other predecessors in title. Um, they're in negotiation with Hamilton County to relocate their facility. <coughs> A variance is necessary for the preservation and enjoyment of a substantial property right, and the authorization of the variance will not be materially detrimental to the public welfare. As stated before, they do have um, trucks already coming in and out of this for loading and unloading. Um, it is a barge loading facility in the township. It has close um, connection to 275 as well as State Route 52, and we feel that um, we're supportive of the request. If the board does choose to approve it, we do suggest or recommend trying to figure out the temporary nature and the length of time. Any questions for the board? What was that last one? The, the requested time frame? A, yeah. a time frame, a okay. specific time frame. Okay. All right. 
All right, would the applicant or his representative come forward to give us your name, address, and your affiliation? Sure, thank you. My name is Tom Tepe, attorney for Hilltop, 1 East 4th Street, Cincinnati, 45202. Um, first of all, I serve in a very similar capacity in my community, so I can appreciate your sacrifice and your time commitment. It's been a long night for you. We'll try to make uh, this as painless as possible. We'll try to make it as exciting as possible to talk about a concrete batch <laughs> plan. But, you know, when you uh, get the chance to throw in the Cincinnati Bengals in that narrative, it's uh, a little bit more exciting than the or ordinary request. Um, with me is Kevin Sheehan, president of Hilltop, along with members of his team. He will introduce them individually. They're here to uh, answer any questions that you may have. We've got the whole uh, brain trust here as it relates to this request. Um, also, Jeff Aludo, Hamilton County Administrator, is here, along with the, uh, the county's legal counsel, Tom Gableman. And finally, Aaron Herzig, legal counsel for the Cincinnati Bengals, is also here. Um, and I do believe they are, intend to offer some comment as it relates to this application. Um, before I turn it over to Kevin, I just want uh, to thank Paul and his staff for putting together a pretty good uh, pretty darn good staff report and being comprehensive and sort of addressing these. This has been a conversation that's been ongoing for a while. Uh, you may or may not have uh, read or heard about some of these uh, moving parts and I'll conclude my brief remarks with, there are a tremendous number of moving parts associated with what's going on. This is the first step. This is an absolute must for all of these other pieces to fall in place so that uh, uh, we can continue with our discussions and continue to um, Hilltop uh, on its progress in, in uh, finalizing its uh, permanent location. And I can tell you, and you'll probably hear this from Kevin, this is simply temporary. Um, their permanent home is a much more uh, sophisticated, larger, and much more profitable location. This is just simply an interim step that uh, they have agreed to do to try to help things move along down at the banks. So with that said, I'll turn it over to Kevin. Okay. If that's okay. Any questions from the board? No. Thank you. Introduce yourself, name, address, and affiliation. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kevin Sheehan. I'm president of Hilltop Basic Resources. My address is 50 East River Center Boulevard in Covington, Kentucky. Um, first, thanks, Tom, for the introduction, and thanks to the staff and to each of you for uh, being here for an extended period of time. We will try to uh, spend enough time to answer your questions, but not too much time to take up uh, any more of your evening. Um, <clears throat> I also have with me tonight uh, some of the members of our management team. So Brad Slayball, who's our general manager, and vice president and general manager. Brad oversees the ready mix operations, among other things, ready mix operations and terminal operations. So the, what we refer to as the East Cincinnati Terminal that's involved here is uh, one of Brad's areas of responsibility. Mark Fallhaber is our Director of Engineering. He's also our Environmental Manager, and uh, Mark spends a great deal of time dealing with uh, both construction um, as well as uh, all, all things environmental related. And uh, last but not least, Brian Baldessere is uh, Hilltop's Chief Financial Officer. Some of you may know him. He is a resident of the area. So Brian joined us, uh, and we're very fortunate to have him in uh, January of this year. Um, I wanted to spend just a few minutes introducing Hilltop in general, and then uh, and then I'll move on to the specifics of our of our proposal and our request. Uh, Hilltop is a 81-year-old uh, company. We were founded in 1941. We are still family-owned. The grandson of the founder, John Steele Jr., is uh, is running and the majority owner of the company. His son Cody is also uh, fourth generation is in the business in a middle management position and working his way up through the organization. We're very proud of the fact that uh, this business is uh, in the third generation and headed into the fourth generation. We employ about 165 people in the Cincinnati area, a total of somewhere around 250 uh, company-wide, but 165 in, uh, in the Cincinnati area. We currently own uh, three mines, we own three distribution terminals, this being one of them, and the downtown one uh, that's the source of all of the movement being another, and then three ready mix concrete operations. I'm gonna mention where those three are because it's important in terms of how we're moving from a downtown to out here on a temporary basis. We have another plant up in St. Bernard, 
which we purchased uh, back in 2020. And um, we have a, uh, a third plant on Mineola Pike in Northern Kentucky, which we uh, started up in 2019. As uh, Tom said, we've been on uh, this particular site since 1985. We acquired the property in the early 1980s, and in 1985 we began um, operations on this site. Um, I'm going to skip some of the, the more uh, uh, details about our mission and our values, but we do have uh, a purpose, and uh, we try to live that purpose every day. Uh, the fact that we are have such a visible presence in the communities we're in uh, mean that we think we have a, a even more responsibility for how we act as individuals and as an organization in those communities. And hopefully um, what you see at the uh, site in question is, is evidence of that. The um, hilltop in the concrete business, we specialize in large commercial industrial projects. That's why we're located downtown. Um, and uh, many of the structures that you see in the area are, uh, have either hilltop aggregate, sand, gravel, limestone, or hilltop concrete in them. We've highlighted a few in the package that was sent to you, uh, but I could go on for probably half an hour, 45 minutes, uh, but some of the ones that are notable, Great American Tower, Paul Brown Stadium, uh, Great American Ballpark, most of the bank's development, uh, and then a lot of infrastructure. Um, uh, Zimmer was actually has hilltop concrete in it, as, as do other power plants in the area. Uh, major interchanges that have been done recently, a lot of uh, concrete going into work on I-75 and I-71, as well as concrete that goes into some projects that have been uh, in the Anderson Township area, as we talked about before. Um, so how do we end up here today? We, uh, we've been at that current site downtown since 1967. We were relocated there um, in order to allow for the construction of the, what ended up being Riverfront Stadium. So we, we're not uh, uh, immune to having been relocated on, uh, on more than one occasion. Um, in the early 1980s, we have, as I said earlier, we purchased the 43 acres on, uh, at Kellogg and, and Five Mile to, and then began the ag aggregate distribution operations where we've been responsibly producing to this day. From time to time, as, it, as has been said, Anderson Township has permitted Hilltop to uh, locate a customer batch concrete plant on the property, generally to support major uh, road jobs in Anderson Township, 1992, 2002, and most recently in 2005. In, uh, in 2017, Hamilton County approached Hilltop about the possible purchase of our property, uh, which is just northwest of Paul Brown Stadium to allow for riverfront development plans surrounding Paul Brown Stadium. In February of 2020, we, Hilltop and Hamilton County, reached an agreement to uh, sell that central riverfront site. Um, at that time, we transferred over to the county the westernmost approximate eight acres of the total of 16 acres that we owned. Um, and on that site currently is where the interim indoor practice facility of the Bengals is being uh, constructed. We are, are remain down there in operations while we find a permanent suitable relocation site. We continue to make progress in uh, uh, finding and developing that uh, suitable relocation, permanent relocation site, but many factors influence the timing of when that will be um, finalized, including uh, the due diligence on the site, the permitting with the city of Cincinnati, uh, the order backlog for ready mix concrete plants and um, and some specific development characteristics of the site that we currently have under contract in within the city limits. Um, recently, Hamilton County approached us uh, requesting that we consider a temporary relocation while a permanent site was being secured and developed. We understand that this is to allow for the prompt expansion of the Bengals related improvements on the remainder of our site. Uh, we also think that this may provide more certainty for our employees and our customers if we make a temporary move uh, that gives us some additional certainty as to how long we're going to be um, able to operate before we have to move to the new site. In response to this request, we placed an order for a new portable plant 
uh, which is the, the specifics of which are in the uh, materials that was provided to you in advance. Um, given supply uh, constraints, um, you can imagine that, uh, like everything else, ready mix concrete plants are not necessarily readily available. Uh, the plant that we place the order on um, is due to be manufactured and available for delivery in mid-November. That's actually earlier than the larger plant that we will someday order for our permanent site, um, and uh, which is out somewhere in the range of 12 to 16 months. Um, <clears throat> we are proposing that the site, the location of the plant will be at the same location where the previous plants, portable plants, have been located. That will also allow some screening from Kellogg, um, as you saw from the pictures uh, that were taken from, uh, from Kellogg Road. The variance request that's before you tonight is to allow us to locate and operate on a temporary basis this portable batch plant while the permanent site is permitted and uh, developed and brought into operational status. We would ask that uh, the temporary plant be permitted to operate for two months beyond the date that our permanent site is fully operational. So um, the, the issue we have is we don't know what that date is. We know that we are in the middle of the permitting process with the city, uh, but there are, in addition to the length of time the concrete plant order will take, there are also some development characteristics on the site that, that, that have to be addressed. So um, we're asking, because I know that the staff mentioned in the report that uh, we should have some definite date, we would ask that the uh, date be uh, when the new site is ready for within two months of when the new site is is fully operational What does that mean could could it mean two years? Yes, it could mean two years could it possibly go beyond that possibly we we uh, And we can talk about I know you may have quite further questions on this be happy to talk about that further But we want to make sure that before we vacate the site downtown that we know we can operate as long as we need to until that new site is ready. Otherwise, we're gonna have employees that are concerned about their jobs, customers that are concerned about our ability to deliver concrete, um, and vendors that are also gonna be concerned. So, um, the, um, what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit of specifics on the, uh, on the, on the plant itself. Um, and I'm, before I get there, I wanna just tell you that uh, the site as it exists today ag distribution terminal uh, we sell about a half a million tons of aggregate out of that site and generally in 20 to 25 ton truckloads so that is averages out to a little over a hundred trucks trips per day in and out of the site um, the proposed temporary plant uh, we would have in operation generally from 7 to 4 o'clock now some days we can start earlier depending on our customer demands uh, other days we may run a little bit later. Um, we will occasionally have Saturday deliveries. That's generally in the morning, seven to, to noon. It is a seasonal business, as you can imagine. Uh, higher volumes in the spring, summer, and fall, less in the winter. Um, this particular plant is gonna be supported by the other two plants that I mentioned earlier. So not all of the volume that we currently do out of the downtown plant is going to be moved out here. Um, we're looking at approximately 115 to 120,000 tons a year. What does that mean on a daily basis? On average, we expect to have 60 ready mix concrete truck trips out of the site. In addition to the continuing ag distribution, 100 tr truck trips um, on average. We said in the, uh, in the uh, proposal that we would restrict the uh, truck traffic, the ready mix truck traffic to moving uh, out of the site going east on State Route 52 and entering the site from the east uh, from uh, 52. We also get, from a, on a daily basis, we have about four cement tanker truck deliveries to support the concrete business, cement being a, a major ingredient in addition to the aggregate into the concrete um, mixing process. We will have approximately 20 full-time employees at the site. That includes roughly 15 ready-mix truck drivers. Um, now that is less than what we have downtown. Right now downtown we have about 50 
so the remainder of those employees will be working out of the other plans um, just a few specifics on the plant itself uh, the the uh, staff reported in there that it does have a height of approximately 73 74 feet uh, we do have a couple of containers for a batch office and a driver uh, check-in room which will be at the north end of the plant in addition at the south end of the plant there are a couple of uh, containers that hold uh, admixtures various uh, ingredients that go into the concrete uh, to accomplish certain things whether it's color or whether it's setting the concrete up faster or slowing it etc the uh, the plant is considered a portable plant meaning it can be moved um, we do not have a location for it to go to when we're complete in operations here um, but one possibility is we would sell it the other possibility is we would uh, we would greenfield another site the uh, there is a conveyor that feeds the plant and then at the top of the plant or uh, up above you have uh, aggregate bins that uh, the uh, the sand gravel and limestone would go into it is a smaller plant than what we have downtown as i said earlier uh, but it is large enough to meet the complexity of the jobs that we uh, will be servicing uh, during this period of time uh, the only other item that's in there that you'll see in the drawings is there is a 20,000 gallon gallon water tank the uh, other comments that I wanted to, to share with you tonight is uh, we do take our environmental responsibility very seriously um, and uh, we do use best practices to ensure that we control uh, the dust and the water uh, that's that's leaving the site we would be required to have um, an air quality permit from the Ohio EPA and we're also subject to uh, standards by the Southwest Ohio Air Quality Agency uh, the permit covers the concrete batch plant the stockpiling conveyors the open aggregate stockpiles and uh, the paved and unpaved roadways we also would be getting a water quality permit from the Ohio EPA and then we're also subject to state emergency response commission uh, uh, reporting for any hazardous materials again um, we we do uh, exercise and employ best management practices uh, from uh, the uh, air and, and water quality in all aspects of the business so um, that's my prepared remarks for for this evening I know there's a, a few others that wish to comment but uh, certainly happy to answer any questions that you might have any questions from the board have you shortlisted any sites for your permanent location I'm sorry have you shortlisted any sites for your permanent yes location? we actually have a site under contract uh, it's west of Cincinnati but is this within the city limits um, we are close to uh, uh, going through the permitting process with this we've actually been working with the city of Cincinnati for the past year on this site uh, but we were very close to going through the permitting process and hope to have the permit sometime before the end of the year without go ahead John if you had a question just a simple question <laughs> sure what timeline would you like us to place on this submission what what I would uh, you mean in terms of the length of time we can have the temporary plant here correct uh, I would ask that it be open-ended and tied into when the new site is fully operational <laughs> We are very comfortable reporting periodically to you the status of our development of that new site and also reporting to you when that new site is operational. We would ask that we would have maybe two months after it's operational as we work the bugs out on the new site uh, before we shut it down. And we would do that. And the other request I would make as part of that is that we have some flexibility in terms of how long that plant can remain on the site as we deliberate what we're going to do with it but most importantly we would ask for the flexibility to have uh, a, an open end until the new site is fully developed okay. yeah I understand your predicament there and there's ongoing negotiations with multiple parties and, right and uh, but at the same time working at it from a township standpoint I, I don't want to just give you from now to eternity understood you know and so how can we come to some kind of resolution of that or is is it possible paul that we could do 
like a X period and then a, 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 an X period on top of that tied to something else? Yeah, I mean, we can. Yes. If I, I, the answer I'm is yes, you can Forget place all the numbers I'm going to say right now. <laughs> okay, we say we're going to give you this for two years and we're going to give you one option for another two years. Something of that nature. Can we do that? Yes, you can place conditions you feel appropriate. Okay, that that's are appropriate. What, you know, okay, we have, we have had other cases too where they they come back after five years, ten years, whatever, and then right. some of our other anchor sites, particularly we've we've heard repeat right. cases. So yeah, that, okay. That's the so as long as we could work that out. Okay. I I the other other request I'm going to make tonight, and um, I don't know if it's appropriate for me to ask this, but um, time is of the essence. And uh, the sooner we can have a decision on this, the better. As, as Tom said, there's various moving pieces right now. Um, and um, so we certainly would, uh, I mean, appreciate uh, uh, this decision uh, as, as, as soon as it's practical. So tonight would be okay? Tonight would be absolutely <laughs> fantastic. Well, okay. Are you, is that it? Is it yes. for you? Okay. Is there anybody else who wants to speak in support? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, go ahead and give your name and address. I'm Jeff Aluto. I'm county administrator with Hamilton County um, at 138 East Court Street, uh, 45202. And I'll be brief. I know it's been a, been a long night. I do want to thank you for the, for the time to speak here this evening. I also want to thank uh, staff for all their work on this. I'm here to support the uh, Hilltops uh, application for the zoning variance. Um, as you've heard from Mr. Tepe and Mr. Sheehan on the surface, this is a this is a zoning variance. But as you've heard, this is this is really underneath that. Um, um, so much more. The the county has been working for decades uh, to turn our central riverfront into a place that is the home for uh, a vibrant and, sus and sustainable community that includes commercial, residential, even right now industrial and entertainment. Um, but central to all of that um, is an effort to make sure that we keep this the the long-term home of our professional sports franchises uh, as you've heard we've been working uh, for years with the Bengals and Hilltop to secure property around the stadium complex uh, to meet the long-term operational needs of the Bengals uh, as evidenced most recently by the uh, the development of their uh, indoor practice facility um, on property previously owned by Hilltop so Hilltop has been an incredible uh, partner in working towards these goals and, and now obviously requires uh, the, the temporary facilities to continue to facilitate these these goals in this acquisition so we're motivated um, concurrent by the concurrent goals of wanting to uh, keep uh, uh, the the needs of the the operational needs of the Bengals in mind as we are about making sure that we keep uh, a long-term long-standing historic uh, manufacturing facility their jobs and economic investment uh, here in the community while we also continue to make this the the long-term home uh, of the Cincinnati Bengals here in the community for the enjoyment of all Hamilton County residents including of course those uh, here in Anderson Township so appreciate your consideration of the, of the request this evening and again thank you for for your time and, and uh, potential partnership in this effort any questions okay. anyone else like to speak in favor I, I will be briefer uh, good evening. I'm Aaron Herzig. I'm a lawyer for uh, the Bengals. We are outside counsel. I'm with the Taft Law Firm, 425 Walnut Street, Suite 1800, Cincinnati, Ohio, 45202. Uh, we just want to express our appreciation uh, for your consideration of this request. Uh, the Steels and Hilltop have been very good neighbors of the Browns and uh, the Bengals for the Brown family and the Bengals, we don't talk about that other team, um, uh, for uh, many, many years, and we appreciate uh, their consideration of moving so that we can continue uh, the operations that the team needs as it looks uh, to continue making Cincinnati and Hamilton County its long-term home. Uh, everything we've done over the last uh, many years has been with the idea that we will be here for a very, very long time helping enhance the riverfront and the community. Uh, we also want to thank the county for uh, its good work and partnership with us over these last many years. Uh, I know it's late, so uh, that's uh, all I need to say tonight. Thank you very much. Any questions from the board? Anyone else like to speak in favor? You're the only one who hasn't spoken the whole night. <laughs> Okay, is there anyone here who wants to speak in opposition? 
Anyone who wants to speak in opposition? Okay. If hearing none, do I have a motion to close? Uh, hold on a second. Um, a couple questions, if I may. Um, uh, sir, you mentioned 160 trucks, 100, 100 trucks of aggregate, and then yeah, we, uh, we about uh, yes, that's correct. When you add the the, the ready mix trucks of right. roughly 60 to the 100 or so that we're doing currently with the aggregate trucks. So, and 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 will all the trucks then leave the property and go east on 52? Well, Brad, that's what we are trying to do with the truckers right now, right? Yes, we're trying to deter. We will. We, the uh, the only difference between they work basically the ready mix concrete truck drivers work for us. The <laughs> aggregate haulers do not work for us, but we do direct them to go east. Sometimes I know that they don't follow that direction, but we certainly will and, and uh, uh, do our best to enforce that. But they're going all over, aren't they? Well, they, yeah, they, they certainly are, um, but uh, for some reason they seem to like to go uh, west on Kellogg where there's, yeah, where there's pools and yes, <laughs> it is a constant battle. Okay. Um, I, I, I want to go back to the time frame question again, mm -hmm. um, because I think what it really means is that we we stay in good communication. Absolutely. You know, and it's kind of like, I don't know what the, you know, I'm, it's not like there needs to be a deadline, but what's the next trigger? You know, do we need to like get back together and, and, and have a conversation in a year and plans are progressing or do we need to go 18 months or, you know, and it's like, this is where it looks like it's headed yeah, or, yeah. I mean, uh, I think that would just kind of be appropriate. And, and we, we're absolutely happy to get together as frequently as you would like. What I want to be careful of as I expressed earlier, is uh, creating any uncertainty regarding Hilltop remaining in operation in the area. So yes, if, uh, I mean, the preference would be to have it open-ended as I described, and we can meet every quarter, we could meet every six months. Um, if, if we had to put a deadline on it, I would ask maybe a three years with a two-year extension. Um, but th that once that new site is is operational, then within two months we would shut it down. Yeah. Yeah, it's the truck trips per day is the number. Out and back. Correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? So, so when you talk about going out, that's a trip. Coming back's a trip. No. 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 No, 160 round trips. Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. Did, 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 did. Some trucks might make four or five trips a day. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 So yeah. No, but you're right. It's, yeah, it's an in and out. So one trip is in and out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I yeah. just thought it was incidents, not necessarily. Right. Yeah. And cool. they're all going east? That's what we're proposing. What about the west? The west? We don't care about price sale? Well, no, they'll they'll be going up to 275. Oh, oh yeah. In fact, well, you know, to be to be honest, quite honest with you, it's this is uh, going to cost us some money because we're coming from a greater distance, and one of the major components of the cost of uh, of our product is the delivery. Mm -hmm. So um, we want to try to get them there as quickly as possible. But putting them on, you know, 275 quickly is one of the ways to do that. When the new facility is up and running, is the intention to return this back to what it is now? That's correct. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to formulate it in my mind. Um, what's your next trigger as to what you're going to know what's happening? I mean, I understand the open-ended because then it's going to be easy and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and I'm looking for how do we keep communications open and, sure. you know, we know what's going to happen. But what's your next date that you're going to know something, you know, with all, with all the moving parts that's going sure. on? Sure. We will uh, likely know something here in the next couple of months. So there are, there's a couple of things in due diligence. One is we're still, we're still completing the environmental work that we're doing. At the new site? At the new site. Okay. Um, that's probably going to take 60 to 75 days. Concurrent with that, we are uh, and have submitted final site plans on the site to the city of Cincinnati 
and it's under review by the zoning department. Um, the process that the city goes through is they will issue us a denial letter. We, on the particular piece of property we're looking at, um, the open aggregate storage is a conditional use, so we have to go through the zoning hearing examiner process. That is about a six to eight week process that we will go through to hopefully get approval. There's a couple other variances we need um, uh, that, that will go along with that. So in all likelihood, assuming everything moves according to plan, um, we will know, we'll have a pretty good idea as to whether or not that site's going to get permitted and whether it meets the criteria on due diligence within, within three, to, three to four months. What's the likelihood of you not getting a permit? I would say that we, we're very optimistic um, and we have, you know, because uh, mind you. if you don't, that's, then all of a sudden our timeline is understood. totally different. Uh, and and uh, just to backtrack, we've been working on this particular site with the city of Cincinnati for over a year now. Um, I won't, and I'm not, I'm not trying to cast aspersions on the city of Cincinnati. There is a process we have to go through and we had some issues to get through with respect to this particular piece of property. Um, once we hit that hurdle and if we close on the property, then it's just a question of ordering the concrete plant and how long does it take for the concrete plant to get in. Right now we're told 12 to 16 months if we ordered it. I'm not ordering it until I know for sure I've got a place for it to go. There is also one other factor on this particular site in that it, there is a warehouse there that has to be demolished, but it can't be demolished until the owner of the property constructs another warehouse. Now, we can be moving along the path of purchasing the plant and installing it while they're constructing this other warehouse. That timing of that could be 12 to, to uh, 18 months uh, once, we, once we've actually purchased the property. So there's a lot of different moving pieces, but most importantly, the permitting process, we should know in three to four months. And, and again, we are, we are optimistic that we've gotten through the hurdles, the main hurdles that we have with respect to that property. So when would you expect to close on the property? Best case. Um, we would anticipate closing on it by the end of the year. End of this year. Mm -hmm. and, and then you'll have a better idea of what the timeline is going to be. Yeah, because at that point I can order the plant. Now, are there any other critical components that could affect that? I don't know. The whole, you know, electrical panels, and there's a number of things that could influence that. But, yeah, I'll have a... So I'll your have, timeline is, okay, so, so maybe by the end of the year, six months, mm -hmm. to get under contract and get permits, right? And then 18 months for the plant... So you're uh, talking two years. 16 months, say. Yeah, but go ahead. So you're, so you're talking two years. Mm -hmm. um, well, let me tell you what we're targeting, what we would like to try to accomplish. We would like to have it in before the end. Now, again, best case, but sometime in uh, the first or second quarter of 2024. 20, 24. Yeah, so roughly two years. Two years. No later than that. So if we gave you two years plus a year, does that work? You were you were talking for three and open, you know, with two. Uh, a two and two would work better. Okay. I, I don't want to get in a situation where we get so close to that deadline that all of a sudden customers are saying, oh, you're bidding a job that's a year and a half out, right. and we don't know if you're going to be in business and be able to no, service I, it. I totally understand. Um, or three and one, I, I, three and one. <clears throat> it doesn't. I mean, two, I two mean, and two would be fine. I mean, we're all kind of guessing, <laughs> right? <laughs> you, you know, right, and, and you, know, yeah. you know, at it, but I, but uh, and, you know, but I think we want to put some uh, some constraints on it, mm -hmm. and more importantly, is what's our next trigger to get together and say, you know, like towards the end of the year, mm -hmm. um, uh, there ought to be a condition or something that says we all get back together mm -hmm. and you know it's there's an update to it sure. and you know you know absolutely buy. happy to do that in any format that you think's appropriate um, yeah, I'll ask that question now I'll, can we actually condition them to come back in for another I, I, I like the approach of Two and two and three or one, you know, no, three and one, right. instead of having them check back in at the end of yeah, the year. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know that, you know, I'm not the attorney here, but I don't know that 
we could actually part of our process condition them to come back and have another meeting with us you know well i could but i understand well <laughs> you could but <laughs> but I, I i i understand there there's a proclivity not to yeah and then, then we just go two and two okay all right any further questions then, then we just go two and two any further questions no thank you thank you sir thank okay you. hearing no further comments no other for or against uh <laughs> Is there a motion we close this public hearing? So moved. Is second. there a second? Will you hear the roll? Mr. Lawrence. Aye. Mr. Sine. Aye. Mr. Haber. Aye. Mr. Halpin. Aye. Mr. Shepherd. Aye. Um, I think we're all in agreement that we want to have this happen. I don't think there's any disagreement on that. I think as the representatives, representatives of the township, we just need to come up with some reasonable end date that a reasonable person and i'm involved in construction myself so i'm not talking to you guys out there i'm just talking to our guys okay uh, so i understand what a messy process this is okay and you're dealing with multiple governmental agencies and i would have no problem going three plus one uh, with the and then uh, at the end of, if for whatever reason things go absolutely 